Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started tonight with the uh, Boulder City Council study session of August 28th, 2018. And we have two issues tonight. The first of which is our fire master plan. And um, we're great, uh, we're very pleased to have the whole crew here, or at least part of it. And um, uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation and having a good conversation. Did you wanna say? Okay. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, for the record, Mike Calderazzo, the Fire Chief. Um, pleased to be here this evening, and uh, thanks for, for your attention to um, our update on the master plan. I brought with me today to my right, uh, Deputy Chief of uh, Support Services, Holger Durr, and uh, to his right, uh, our Medical Director, Dr. Shannon Silvendahl, and to his right, um, Deputy Chief of Operations, Jeff Long. So. We're all here to hopefully answer questions if you have any, um, and I'll just go ahead and get right into the plan. So I <clears throat> wanted to start by just kind of giving a brief overview of the department and uh, just sort of ground our discussion this evening. So <clears throat> if you look at the slide, uh, the services that we provide really run the gamut of uh, prevention and response. And starting on the left side of the table that you see there, those are all of our response-related services, and I won't go through every single one of them, but starting um, at the home safety assessments, which is second up from the bottom on the left, and going over to the right, we have a whole uh, plethora of prevention-related services, and we try, you'll see in our presentation, we've been doing more and more of that, since that's where the best money really is spent to try to prevent emergencies from happening. But we do all of those services um, with a, a staff of 124 authorized FTEs. And we broke it down somewhat. We have 97 firefighters um, that work across three shifts, and we have eight full-time wildland responders, and then the community risk team is the team that does most of the right-hand side of that service is provided. And then the balance of the 124 are our support staff that aren't actually listed up there um, by number. <clears throat> Quick facts about uh, what we protect, of course, the 25.8 square miles of the built up portions of the city. Um, but we also, um, while we're not the primary responders for the open space, the 70, almost 71 square miles, um, we provide the overhead and the coordination and assistance to uh, the responders in the county that take care of any fires should they start um, in open space land, which is county land, uh, or under county control, actually. So. <clears throat> We also um, put up here the number of training hours that team delivers, because that's a big part of what they do, not just respond to fires, but actually train the local responders so we have all the help that we can need regionally. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out before I moved off the slide is the fact that even though fire rescue is our namesake, 81% of our calls are EMS. And so emergency medical is a huge piece of our response and prevention pie, really. Some annual statistics from our last master plan to now. <clears throat> you can see that our a number of calls have gone up, um, but what has stayed fairly consistent is the percentage of, of emergency medical incidents. Um, but we're also really, really working hard on tracking now um, outcomes. So what you see here is just life safety education participants. So we try to reach as many people as possible with our, with our safety messages. Um, but we're also working on um, plans to get some outcomes. We want to we know that behaviors are changing, actually, is, what, is what's important to us. So here are some of the things we achieved since our 2012 master plan. There was a whole bunch of items in the master plan. I'll just highlight really just the one on the left. Uh, the upper left there talks about our call triage system. What that basically is, um, we instituted a system in our dispatch center that basically questions the caller to the point where we try to get the right information to send the right resource. So instead of sending everything to every call, um, this system just basically drills down to the specifics so that we can get maybe one, sometimes two, or whatever resource we need. Before that, we used to send everything because we didn't, we didn't have a, a, a systematic process for triaging calls. That started in 2013. And we've been using to refine, we're trying to refine that every single month as we look at the call data that we find. So that's a little overview of what we've done. I have a quick question, if sure. I may. Mm -hmm. What is the additional time added in asking those additional questions? So it depends. Um, <clears throat> we're still 
working through trying to drill down to get to what the most two, two most important pieces of information are location and the nature of the call. Um, it really doesn't take uh, a whole lot longer than that to figure out what type of resource needs to go. So I, it's, it's not intended to add seconds, but I think it probably does add a little bit of time to the call um, above those two questions. Because there are some additional questions that help to decide whether do you need an advanced life support unit, and we'll talk about that later in the, in the uh, presentation, or do you need just a basic life support, or is this just something as simple as um, we, we need somebody to come help lift someone up into their, into their bed. It's a, it's a husband and wife and they're older and the wife can't help the husband. So we will send someone at times to do that. <clears throat> and can I just, do people know what advanced and basic are? Probably like not, support? but I'll explain it. Okay, but this I mean, when you're trying to, exp if somebody's kind of um, freaked out, and they're wanting some get your response, and you're asking, well, what do you want, basic, or do you want Great question. Answer? We don't even ask those. Okay. That's not part of the question tree. So the question tree is actually just trying to get to what is your, we call it chief complaint, but what is the main reason for the call? And so there's, and then there's some sub questions that are asked just to see, is it trouble breathing? So it's just those kinds of symptomatic questions. And then based on that, the system automatically dispatches. So that's, that's the neat thing about that system. So I'm taking the call and I write in what's going on and then it, it pushes the dispatch out. And that's, that's what we've implemented. So it's a lot, that's made it faster. So some things that we are gonna continue to look at um, as part of the 2012 master plan and now our update, um, we learned as part of uh, one of the goals was to, create, to look at our fire stations, assess them, and figure out whether they were the right size and so on. Location wasn't part of that. We had a consultant actually study the size of the stations for all the services we provide. And, uh, and that recommendation came out, I forget now, I think it was 2015, um, and basically showed that we have some undersized infrastructure and, and they're inefficient um, because they were designed for basically a different set of services 50, 60 years ago. Um, we still have a diversity in the workforce issue. That is a nationwide issue, but we have it as well. We were actually better in the 80s as far as gender diversity, but we're just not seeing the people, you know, the, the females in the pool, the candidate pool. So this is something we wanna work on and keep working on um, in our master plan. And I'm not gonna go through all five, but um, one of the other big ones is that middle one there. You know, this is a very stressful job. It's hard on the mind, hard on the body and the heart. And um, you know, we want healthy, firefighters inside and out, and uh, we wanna do everything we can to make sure they have a long and fruitful career and are able to serve for as many years as possible here in the city. So, so that's something we wanna look carefully at we're do, if we're doing all the right things there based on best practices. Um, so those are some, some of the items that we wanna keep looking at. I'm gonna shift now to some of the inputs that we're using for the master plan uh, update. And, <clears throat> One of the big things in the 2012 master plan was to create what we call a community risk assessment and an associated standard of cover. And I'll explain what those mean. The, the risk assessment is essentially what you would think it is. We look at what's, what, what threatens Boulder and uh, it runs the gamut, we all know that. But this actually puts numbers and, um, and puts boundaries and so on and so forth, it's pretty in depth. The two highlights that came out of the community risk assessment Almost a no-brainer, right? Uh, wildfire and EMS, those are the big ones. Now, EMS is, is not a localized disaster, but more of that chronic stressor that's basically going to, as the community ages, stress the system more and more as we use the 911 system, as we use um, you know, the medical system in general. So that's what we expect is going to happen. That was our risk assessment. And what the standard of cover basically does is it takes, yes, sir. Just a quick question. Is there a reason that flood isn't up there as one of the bullet points? You can blame me. <laughs> so flood is a risk. It actually is, um, and there's way more risks actually included in the standard of cover. We highlighted what we thought were the two big ones most likely to affect in the next three to five years, though flood is still something that could happen any point in the next three to five years. So it's still a risk we have to address in the, in the master plan. Um, so just for the sake of the slide, we highlighted the two big ones, but flood is still something we look at for sure. Um, 
So what basically the standard of cover does is it takes that risk and it looks at the way we're deployed, it looks at our resources and says, hey, here's your gaps. And um, increasingly what the standard of cover used to be in the fire service was a document that just analyzed your reactionary stuff, so just your response related stuff. So are you, what are you doing on the back end of a 911 call? Nowadays, we're also looking at what are you doing on the front end of a call to actually change the risk profile in the community. And that's a big part of the standard of cover. So prevention-related activities, what are you doing, what can you do, where are the gaps? Um, what are you measuring, what are you not measuring? Uh, response to the EMS demand, what we're doing today. We, we have a certain system that's in place today. Is it the right one? And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, um, a discussion around building community resilience. That's a big deal, but in this case, we're talking about the acute stressors like disaster, localized disaster, kind of like the floods or a wildfire, and then public health concerns, the longer term ones, the chronic stresses. What, uh, how, what role does the fire play in that with all the other players in the community? So this is another piece of the technical puzzle that goes as far as the inputs into the master plan go. Um, on the left is a depiction of the four minute travel times from the stations. This is, you'll see a different picture later on. This is if they could travel from the station at the speed of the, the posted speed limit with no impediments whatsoever. I mean, the moment they got out of the station, they traveled the speed. So it's a it's perfect world scenario. The real deal is probably closer to the lighter second color is probably what they're more likely able to cover in the four minute travel time. But it's good, it's a good input. It's good for us to see what that actually looks like. And you can actually tell over the way Boulder built out is more based on the old insurance services office standards and that's kind of playing out here in this picture where they space stations every mile and a half just based on rules of thumb rather than actually looking at travel times and things. Um, and then on the right, another example from the standard of cover is where are your incidents today? So the heat map shows, as probably everybody intuitively already knows, here's where all the calls to the 911 center are generating from and where we're heading to. So you can see in the city core, we're pretty stressed from those three stations that are surrounding. Those are those dots, the yellow dots. Um, and so those units are, get a high volume of work, especially during the school year. Part of the inputs to the master plan, we're looking at the EMS system and how we're deployed. And, I, and this, this slide takes a little explaining, but fundamentally what we did was, all right, we deliver basic life support and we contract out advanced life support to the, the ambulance company, AMR. And right now, at, at, at any one time, there's probably two or three ambulances in the city. Um, they do that to try to keep expenses down. I mean, they're, they're, they're in business for a profit, and as long as we can provide first due response time with basic life support, we can kind of stop the clock at four to five minutes most times. Chief, can I interrupt just briefly? <clears throat> if you could explain basic life support and advanced life support really quickly. I think sure, sure. Um, so basic life support is um, a, an, an emergency medical technician level that covers um, fundamental things like CPR, um, the application of oxygen, um, being able to splint injuries um, on the scene, so, so broken arms and things like that, they can apply splints. So basic, basic first aid type care, a little, little more supercharged than that. Advanced life support, the fundamental difference, and the medical director can correct me when I'm wrong here, but the fundamental difference is really the ability um, to use more advanced cardiac care devices and to, and to push medications. So they, can, they, they start the IVs and they can start on the scene applying appropriate medications um, under medical control. And, and that's the fundamental difference between the two versions. And so what fire provides is the basic piece. And then when the ambulance gets there, we got the advanced level responder and actually push the drugs. Um, so, you know, when it comes to um, serious um, medical issues and so on, you're gonna want the advanced life support there as quickly as possible. So, so when the white paper was prepared, we were taking, um, this idea of the three stations. So the red dots are where the fire stations are today. And the three in the center, the core center, are actually overworked pretty hard. And the idea was at some point in the next three to five years or so, we're really gonna need another unit, probably a small one, 
to respond to the types of medical emergencies in there full time. We need, we need one to start covering some of that, re relieving some of those other units. And if that's the premise we were going to be operating from in our master plan, then why not look at changing the advanced life support coverage altogether? Because right now you're looking at eight, nine, ten minutes for the advanced life support responder to get there. Um, and we could, with adding, if upping the level of our firefighters to paramedic or advanced life support status, now we're changing it from three, two to three units in the city to what you see there, um, 10 basically. And the three crosses that you see on that map would be accomplished by posting those units during peak times. And so what that map is trying to depict is by strategically locating them at key times, you can cover the city with a four minute travel time with advanced life support um, within four minute travel times for just about every single resident. What does it mean to post them? So posting means they won't be at a fire station, they'll be at a location where our system anticipates the next call. So those, they would be, that's what they do today. They don't actually have stations. The ambulances don't go back to a station. They will post at certain locations and, and where they think the next call is gonna come from to, part, to try to minimize the response time. So we would do something similar, but do that during peak peak load hours is what we would do. And then they would go back um, to the stations. But this is a way to cover most of the city where, when most of the calls happen. How often, <clears throat> excuse me, how often do they get it right that they anticipated the location of the next call? They do a pretty good job. I would say that AMR does a decent job. Um, we are, but our standards are you need to be there by nine minutes. So what we're saying here is change the nine minutes to, uh, and that includes, that includes notification time. So change the nine minutes to closer to six minutes total is what, we're, what the white paper was recommending. Bring it down. Get the advanced level responder there faster. The only way to do that is to really up the game of the firefighters and then add some units to the system, so. So I'm gonna switch now to, um, from the technical piece of it to the input piece, or the, the community input piece of our master plan. And uh, we're one of the pilot projects for the new community engagement uh, work that uh, we've started. And we've, begun, we've got a page on the Be Heard Boulder site, and we have a survey up that we're asking folks to answer a series of questions. We've been visiting with neighborhood, going to block parties, one-on-ones, lots of, lots of those kinds of visits. But this has been our single biggest way to get some immediate feedback from uh, residents of Boulder. And what we found so far, and, and take this with a grain of salt, because this has been out just, I think, a month or two, and we've got about 140 or 150 responses so far. But this is what folks are telling us are important to them. Stands to reason emergency medical services is on everyone's mind. Wildfire and structure fire are, are the three big ones that we notice people are really drilling down to. And then we asked why, why, why are, you know, what, what is it that, or in terms of EMS, what would you be willing to support? I'm sorry, not the why, that's next. But the response that we're getting is there are many that, that really would support this idea of um, us playing a more um, expanded role in the delivery of, of EMS in terms of the level of care that we provide. And most would even consider supporting additional funding. Of course, that's the magic question. Well, how much? And, and that's what we have a consultant working on right now to verify some numbers and update the ones that we put in the white paper. But here's what, this is the why piece. We asked why, why would you support uh, ALS? And um, the, the number one reason is lower average response times. I think people are agreeing that, yeah, it would be great to have the ER come to me in six minutes or less, and okay. And then a, a second, the number two reason is actually to see that it's based on that, I think that one slide that shows a greater number of advanced life support units in the city can only be good if, if they're closer to me. It stands to reason they'd be able to get to me faster. And the last piece is, I don't know, I didn't think people understood this, but basically they would, they want the same paramedic who meets them on the scene originally to go with them all the way to the hospital to hand off to the ER doc and nurses. So, so that was an important factor for people too. Don't hand me off two and three times 
to get before I get to the hospital. So here's our focus areas that um, we believe are the areas we should be looking at for the 2018 update. Um, education and prevention, and anything and everything we can do to leverage community partnerships. So the stuff that's already happening in our region, the, the, the um, organizations that are doing good things, how does fire play a role with them and, and work with them? Um, obviously, optimizing our deployment based on our standards of cover and the risk is an important piece. And that's really a discussion about people assets and even some community assets like um, the water supply or utilities. Um, how, how does that play a role and how do we look at that in a, in a disaster environment and, and that kind of thing. And the last piece is then this, this concept of, of fire-based advanced life support. It's provided now in the city, but is the level of advanced life support appropriate for, for this community? And so this takes us to where we are now. Um, we are gonna continue our community engagement. The pilot continues through towards the end of the year, pretty much. Um, we're gonna shift our focus to an internal stakeholder engagement around October, so that's kind of the time frame there. And then our EMS consultant is, like I said, updating numbers, looking at options, and going to make a recommendation in the next 30 to 60 days on uh, some, some possible um, routes that we could take. Um, and hopefully not break the bank in doing that. Um, and then winter after like December and beyond, we're looking at a draft plan for our master plan and then presentation through the process, the planning board, and then back in front of you all, hopefully in spring of 2019 for implementation later in the year and into 2020. So that's kind of where we are in the process. And that'll take me to our final slide, and that I'll just summarize these because I know you, you've read them and you see them for yourself. But we're really asking um, your feedback on our progress from the old, the, the 2012 master plan, as we've described it. And um, if you have any feedback for us on the community risk assessment or standards of cover, those are big documents. I know it's a big read. Um, we posted them even on the website, but, but uh, it's a lot of technical stuff in there. And then, um, do you support continued exploration of this idea of improving the level of advanced life support, excuse me, um, or are we where we need to be? And then finally, do you have any um, suggestions or do you agree with the, the three main focus areas of the master plan going forward? So that's, I'll stop talking now and I'll turn it over to you all. Excellent, well thank you for, so much. Why don't we start off with questions, Aaron? Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Could you go back to the slide, please, that had the uh, red dots and blue crosses, please? That yeah, was that one right there. Okay, so um, if we're talking about moving to fire-based advanced life support, can you walk us through, like, what kind of personnel and vehicles are at each of those spots? And, and could I just ask that in addition to that, when he's answering, he could give us costs? To the extent that you have them. Yes, I don't know that I have good costs at the moment, but I'll try. Um, orders of magnitude. Okay, let me start with the, the, the trucks. So I would say that the three crosses for sure would be smaller vehicles. So those would be, this is what we're hoping the consultant will confirm for us, but they could be an SUV, they could be but capable of transport in, in a dire emergency. We'd still have an ambulance, I, I suspect they could be ambulances too, I, I guess I should say that. They could be ambulances, they could be smaller, they're gonna be smaller ones. Um, and that's why we've, we've not given up on the idea of the light rescue vehicle in general, sending the smaller trucks to, to the scene of an, a medical emergency, because this gives us a faster avenue to doing that. And three units actually would cover a good portion of all of our medical calls, and so um, that's not happening now. And when, we, when we're forced to send a fire truck to stop the time, it's a fire truck. We don't, we don't actually have a smaller vehicle. The, the stations couldn't even accommodate one if we, had, if we bought one. Um, so that's, I hope that helps. So the red dots would probably be the bigger units with the exception of maybe one of the red dots. We could put a smaller unit in one of those. And then the, the blue crosses would be the small, smaller trucks, either an ambulance or an SUV what we call a chase car, something like that. So that's what we envision. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, those smaller vehicles, where would they be based out of? Because they're posted here, right? They're Correct. not at the station, they're posted. So 
So we would, go we have room at the station one, you can barely read it there, but it's, uh, it's the second, if you head north on the left there, that's station one, um, it's the farthest west station. Um, and then hopefully we can build our new station three and have enough room to accommodate that there as well. Right. Um, and with some maneuvering, we could accommodate it at station two, but I don't know that we're gonna quite recommend that Partly because if you've been to our fire station two, the only way to get another truck, we'd have to respond backwards out of that station to make it work out onto Broadway, and it's not the best arrangement, but if we had to, we could. Okay, but we have an opportunity with the new station three to- We definitely have one there, for sure. There. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of personnel, who, what kind of training do the people in these various units have in, with regards to life support in your vision here? What they have today? No, 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 in the vision of- Oh, in the vision. ALS. So in the vision, what we would, what the white paper basically suggested is, and um, you can weigh in on this too, Doc, if you like, but um, you don't stand up um, an ALS system overnight with green paramedics. And so the, the smarter way to do it is to start training in the core areas of the city. So you'd have responders in the first three stations and then build out from there. Um, to a point where then every station has the paramedic level responders with the appropriate equipment. So they carry more advanced equipment as well. So we'd have to make room on the trucks for the equipment, but it's not a big deal. And we'd have to have uh, the, the, the space for the medications too. Um, but we'd start smaller, build out from there, um, phase it in. And, and with that phasing plan, how does that interact with our um, ambulance contracts? So there's a few ways to, to work that as well. Um, if we move to an ALS model, um, and I'm, I'm speaking before I even have the, the consultant's final words here, so. Um, but n my knowledge of the system is basically, we'd be able to use them in a basic life. So we'd, we'd turn it upside down. So the advanced life support responders would be all over the city, and the ambulance providers would be the ones that hold the BLS license, the basic life support. And, and the only time we would really need the, the bus or the transport capability is when the paramedic on the scene says, we've got to have that here. Or the nature of the call says, go ahead and run the ambulance because we're pretty sure when the paramedic stabilizes the patient or gets going there, they're going to need to get in the, in the ambulance and go. But we can still work with a private company to do that part of the system. We don't actually have to take over the ambulances to up our advanced life support um, coverage. Yep. If you can have the mic there, Doc. Can we introduce? Hi, Shannon Sovendahl. I'm the medical director. So thanks for having me. Excited to be at the city council meeting. Um, the the way that you or that I think we should look at this is we're looking at the overall level of service. So currently, Boulder City Fire offers BLS, which is basic life support. Those are those basic interactions. That's what happens when a fire truck shows up. You get basic life support. The next level up from that is ALS, advanced life support. And that is advanced care, advanced interventions, advanced medications. So think about this as a basic system, an advanced life support system, and then as a transport system. So there's three different tiers to this. There is hands-on initial care, advanced life support, and then transferring a patient from scene to the hospital. And so that the way that we look at that and where we move with this has different options. And that's why when you say what are those crosses or what are these represent. What I say when I look at this is that what we're suggesting in that white paper is moving from a BLS service, basic life support service, to an ALS service so that there are more positions across the city where an advanced life support provider puts their hands on you at a rapid time interval. So we're cutting down that response to give you advanced life support. The next question then is how do we get you from where we are to the hospital? And whether that is a contracted private entity such as uh, an AMR, or if that's in-house, meaning that you own ambulances as a city, that is the kind of the next step on the conversation. So I think when we're discussing this, it is, um, you know, a little bit clearer to say, what, what are we talking with the level of care and transport as three different things, BLS, ALS, transport. And so we're, we're mixing those together here. And the plan is to answer all three? The, the, it's the plan, supposed to get to that final question. Absolutely, so the, the white paper makes that you know recommendation from us reviewing it. Um, we have the consultant that's gonna give input as well. What my push is, my opinion, um, is, is that you know I wanna have that ALS 
care provided to the community, meaning I live in Boulder, what is the level, what's the standard of the communities around us, what's kind of the national um, level of this for a response when you call 911. And to me, that is that ALS responder that's arriving. And so when you look at the cost, you're talking about staffing, um, a, a skilled position, even more so than an apparatus. There's tools that they have with them, but that can be placed on a fire engine, that can be placed on an SUV, that can be placed on an ambulance. So how you're delivering that service, you're really trying to get the level of care, the paramedic, to the scene. And that's what we discuss. And we do have different um, models of that. Great. Well, thank you for the, answering this question. I think it really helps to clarify and for the council and the community kind of what the potential vision is and the directions we might go. I have Cindy mm -hmm. and Did, Sam. Can I answer your council members, uh, Carlisle's uh, funding question? Is that yes, and I have question? a range of them, but or a number of questions, but Sam, that are kind of all built into that as oh, well. Okay. Okay. So, so, well, I was just going to, it's right along your lines of costing. If we look on page 166 of the packet, and that's attachment C, that is the white paper that evaluated this, I wanted to make sure, <clears throat> does this get at Cindy's question? And so my question is, you show in here year four differences between status quo, which I assume is today, and gradual implementation, which I assume means we're moving towards uh, advanced life support and transport system mm -hmm. that and so th the question is it shows a net annual difference of about $175,000 a year is that a number that you feel I mean does that include amortizing the trucks I mean how do you does it have the truck spot as a lump sum I mean can you tell us how you got to those numbers because they're very interesting and important numbers one of the one of the things I want to make sure we all understand built into that um, that spreadsheet is the white paper proceeded from the assumption that because the centralized companies are overworked, you're going to need one anyway in the next three to five years. So we're going to need an additional unit. We were, it, I, I am certain that the master plan would say, add a unit to relieve the burden in the central core area of the city. And that would be the three firefighters per shift. I would prefer that it not be an engine, but an actual an engine, meaning the big, huge, big red truck but a smaller vehicle. But it makes almost no sense to just put them as a basic life support. If we're already gonna go there, the white paper basically said, we should probably look at an advanced life support model instead of, and the reason, and this part I did not mention is, the advantage to doing this, as opposed to what we do today, is this is an all hazards response. So this is not just oh, you get an advanced level responder, 98% coverage of the city in four minutes travel time or less. This is for all hazards. The system that we have today basically says for EMS, my AMR, all I can use them for is EMS related calls. Granted, that's 80% of our calls, but the other 20%, you got four minute travel time coverage, 98% of, of the city. That's a big difference than what we have today. We drop down to just the seven stations for all hazard coverage, and that's that's. So I got I got all that. I'm certainly appreciative of that, and glad you're saying it. If we can come back to costs for a sure. little bit, sure. So <clears throat> that so, leads me to the cost piece. Yeah. So the reason that the 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 hundred and seventy thousand is in, so it includes all of the expected replacement pieces of the puzzle, and I and you guys have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we we made them basically ambulances is what what we we had decided they would be. Right. So we we. We funded the replacement as an ambulance. It's obviously going to be cheaper if it were if they were a different type of unit, um, but that was the assumption made in, in the cost. So the $170,000 difference also does not assume that AMR is going to come back and keep upping the rates, that, the subsidy that we pay them for the living wage piece. I don't expect that to stay where it's at today. And so we did not factor that into that mix. We simply just said, okay, here's, here's what it looks like. Um, and, and we believe, and this is what we're asking the consultant to do as well, update our numbers, because these are two years old now at least. And so we want them to update the numbers, make sure that they verify and validate what was put together here, um, and evaluate options for going to this or some hybrid of this that does not break the bank. But there are capital costs because the way our, we're still going to have to, regardless of whether we change anything about our system, 
all of our stations, based on our needs assessment, need to be upgraded, updated. Some of them need to be relocated. That's, that's, that's been an issue for us for a long time. But if we're going to start doing these, having these discussions about our stations, then we really should look, about, look at the types of services that are being provided and whether or not we have an opportunity to change that level. And that's really the, the, the idea here. So, so, so the 177, that's great. Pure operational. Pure operational changes to make this gradual change um, to go to ALS. Okay. So let me, uh, maybe just to, to clarify that question, because that sounds, you know, to make these numbers bigger, is, is what you're taking into account is that we're paying a subsidy. We're right. paying a subsidy for ALS service, right? So we pay some money to have someone transport our patients. And then in addition to that, we made the assumption that we're going to need more units to respond to all hazards, which is an additional engine. So that's the second piece. And then the third piece of this is that whenever you transport a patient in an ambulance to the hospital, that is, um, th there's a reimbursement for that. Um, and so AMR collects that, private company collects that. If you were making that a public service, the public can decide whether they're going to continue that fee structure or provide it. So when you are looking at these numbers, that's what we're trying to compare. We're trying to keep all those things equal, which means, you know, reimbursement, cost of additional unit, and subsidy. And then this is the cost on top of that. So, yeah, I was going to go there. I'm, I'm, I, so basically, I was going to say that costs are offset by patient revenue. So that's what's embedded in the, in the um, uh, spreadsheet. So it, we used AMR's, number at the t AMR's numbers at the time. They're now collecting probably around, um, I think, for the community total, I know it's between 8 and $9 million a year. That's their gross receipts. Um, for 911-based transports, it's a little hazy. They don't break it out for us like that. I'm guessing between 6 and $7 million a year they're making off patient revenue. Then they collect our 535000 that we pay them, and now they're going to collect another 350 thousand from the county to do the same thing for the county. So, so they're... They're collecting all the revenue right now, and we're helping them stop the clock. So we're kind of already helping. Well, we are definitely subsidizing them in a real way, but we've always subsidized a private ambulance's response system by providing this first unit stop the time kind of thing. Wow. Okay, so Cindy's... Did you get your... She, she has a bunch of questions. Okay. Wait, are you done, Cindy? Sam? I'm going to a different subject, so... Okay. I just wondered if you would give us, so you say that you, we, the city is subsidizing the am, private ambulance service. However, if you take this over, you don't charge for it, right? We, or do you? I, we, that's what I don't understand. We assume that we did. So we assume that either, as, as the doctor was saying, we'd charge it just a flat fee structure in multiple ways to fund the system through patient revenue. Some set up a separate fee. That's actually one of the questions in our survey to the community. How, would, how do you think it should be funded? Um, others do what AMR is doing today. It's, it's basically um, patient care revenue. It, it, usually it's the insurance company or Medicare, Medicaid. Part of the challenge is Medicare and Medicaid only, only reimburse about 30% of the true cost of all the transports. And so where, where most ambulance services make their money, is not actually a 911 service. It's an interfacility transfers. So they, you know, taking them from here and moving them down to Denver, that kind of thing. That's not the system we'd be wanting to do. Purely 911 transports, and I think that the revenue is probably in Boulder around six to seven million a year is what they're collecting. So you would be hoping to recoup that if you expanded your service into this kind of thing. I didn't quite get Correct. that. Correct. And my, I guess my longer range um, question is when, if 82% or 81% of the, your response, responses are EMS, when did this shift so dramatically to fire becoming the first responder for this kind of, did it begin with the 9-11 calls or, I mean, this is so just kind of different, right, in terms it's of. Pr it's probably, in the service in general, in the country, the shift actually started happening in the 60s and 70s. Um, and you saw the real stark contrast in the 80s. Um, but if you remember the old, what was the name of the show, Emergency, the Squad 51? 
that was well ahead of its time. Those guys were paramedics, but that was those were firefighters doing that. That's back in the 70s. But the real shift was around the 60s when they started taking over EMS um, as a as a municipal response to the to the issue. And and also with the I'm assuming as well with the differences in technology for fire su suppression, like sprinklering buildings, etc. Absolutely. So that you're not doing those kinds of responses as much. Our, our prevention efforts have really paid off over the last 50 years, and most of it is code enforcement, you know, better codes, better enforcement, sprinklers, things like that, that have really helped that a lot. Of course, climate change may change all this. It might. <laughs> Sorry, go on. So if it's just the basic response at this time, is does the fire department recoup anything from, so that's just all subsidized by our taxes, city taxes. Yes, ma'am. Correct. So when we're talking about those levels of service, the BLS service, the ALS service, those mm -hmm. aren't reimbursed. Either one of the service in itself offered from a fire department, it's the mm -hmm. transport. Mm -hmm. And that is a fixed rate by Medicaid, Medicare. So that's not something that a city essentially says, we're going to set our own rate for that. That's just essentially set. So whether you're, you know, uh, an AMR or a company B, you're getting reimbursed for a certain amount at a fixed rate that mm -hmm. Medicare deems is the rate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why when we look at the calls, we can say we know what percentage of a reimbursement happens for a call because that's set by the government, essentially. Um, so again, when a fire department takes over that transport, it is customary that that fire department, and there are exceptions, but more often than not, that fire department will recoup the Medicare Medicaid rate for transport. Um, that's different than when the fire department responds to a fire right. and there's no bill. Right. Okay. And, and one more question. I'm assuming that um, you have that there are comparisons where other cities have done this kind of thing and they've come out in the more in the black in terms of expanding for their basic services and so it's it's not regions, it's as black and white as you might think, particularly when you go to a fire based EMS because of the all hazards piece of it. Since we convert firefighters slash rescue technicians to emergency medical technician paramedics, they now do it all. So they're, they're full range of services and it's not just EMS. So to split the cost off and say this is just the EMS piece is a lot harder to do and, and ask a community, hey, were you able to recoup the cost? My best guess is most places, um, if you were able to do that mental exercise, I would guess you're looking at between 50 to 60% of the expenses um, to up the level of service to that, you're recovering from patient revenue. That's a, a guess. And we're hoping the consultant can help a little bit with that information for us. Um, but I would never ever say, we're gonna get one for one dollar back based on patient care revenue. This is more a discussion of where we are in terms of the actual level of response and the incremental cost of, of getting to that level. EMS is, Could a, I interject is a level for of service. A Thanks. Oh. Yeah, I, we were, we've been talking about cost and whether or not this would end up in the black or possibly in the red. I really want to caution us not to get tied to the numbers that are in the white paper. The white paper was not done with the kind of rigor that I think we are seeing from our consultant. Um, and as Michael already point, pointed out, it's two years old. So we are waiting to get that consultant's report before we bring more accurate numbers forward. So in, in, in a general sense, this seems like a great idea and that we will be able to recover some revenues from it, but the experience of many fire departments that also provide emergency medical service is not as positive as what this white paper is showing. So just be cautioned by that. And, and I was gonna comment that the providing EMS, uh, at providing a subsidized EMS service, whether you're paying a private company or the fire department, when you choose the level of service you want, that's a level of service that we're choosing. It's not a, a model of income or, or revenue. So. <laughs> We, we make a model and we say there is revenue to be obtained from transporting patients, but that doesn't offset the cost. So I wouldn't leave this meeting and ever think that essentially this is a good business decision to make money. Mm -hmm. You're choosing a service level. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want to say, I want to pay for ALS service, I want to pay for someone that's a paramedic to show up in this amount of time, that's going to cost you a certain amount of money. And that's what we're talking about in this discussion. So it's a community decision. It's a community choice to say, what level of service do we want? And how much are we willing to pay for that service? So Great. again, I, I, I want to be clear that we're not sitting here saying that this is I think we got it. even or making money. That is not what this service does. It is a level of service the same as the fire department responding to a fire. You're, you're having an insurance policy for a bad event. OK, process question. We, in theory, we're spending 15 more minutes on this. So we will let's move on to other questions. And then we're going to get to our input. And right now, I have Sam, Mirabai, Mary, Lisa, and Bob. Oh, you weren't there. OK. <clears throat> Sam, Mary, Lisa, Bob. My question is actually going to go back to Jane because my um, I'm looking on page 176 of the packet, and it seems like many many peer departments do fire-based EMS. I mean, if you look at the checklist, and then you've got Denver, which has its interesting mix, where you've got Denver Health that runs the the paramedic service, and you've got the fire service run by Denver. So, Jane, why did you say that? many other cities don't have as positive an experience because my my perspective is a little different and I'm curious what you think well it depends what how you define positive experience so from from my point of view it it's a great service and those cities that have selected that service it is a good service for the community the cost of it is high and it is subsidized in my opinion, um, based on other cities that I've been in, by tax dollars. And that's a fine choice for the community and a council to make, but this is not a free service, and it, it isn't, you don't recoup its cost from charging patients. So all, the only point that I was trying to make is that I felt like the white paper presented a rosy picture that all we need to do is come up with $175,000 and bingo, we're going to be able to afford this. I don't think that's true, and that's why I am anxious to receive the report of the consultant that we've hired to actually look at it in more detail. You're good. Mary. So my question is kind of related to cost, but not really. Yeah, it is. But the upping the service to ALS, um, does that mean that all of current staff firefighters would need to become paramedics? No, not all of them would. We, we could train. So all we need is one per truck to be the paramedic. So one in each one of the three in each of the three shifts? For each, yes. Okay. And so that, um, that training, is that part of benefits that are already available through, you know, union contracts or whatever? Um, or is that an additional expenditure? It, it's, so I believe it will be an additional expenditure after we negotiate what it would do to up their level of training. It is not a provision in the current contract, even the one we just, um, uh, the firefighters just approved. Um, we would have to negotiate what that would mean for them. And that, I think that also is covered as a discussion piece in the white paper. You can't really get to that without some sort of contractual negotiation that says, okay, well, if you're going to increase the level of responsibility for the firefighters, what is the associated pay for that? So that's not, that's not, um, a provision we have today. Lisa? I have a few questions, but I'll just ask one in um, to save time. So I guess my question and all these costs and stuff is what do you do when you have an uninsured person or somebody who just has no means in which to pay for such a service, but their physical condition requires help? So they'll be treated regardless. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's never the issue on the treatment side of the house. On the bill side of the house, um, a lot of cities will set up indigent if if they're running a if they're running the ambulance service as part of the fire uh, the city services, then they'll they'll set up some sort of indigent claim kind of process. The other thing that a lot of um, private ambulances do is they'll 
they, they just like any other company, they'll age the receivables and then they'll eventually write it off um, completely. Um, it depends on the company and it depends on the city. So, but there, there are ways to deal with folks who simply cannot pay. The care doesn't, the care, you know, from the ambulance to the ER, obviously we don't, we don't ask insurance before someone's treated. They're just treated for the level of care. Inherent in the numbers that the companies utilize for reimbursement, we know what that percentage is based on populations. So meaning that the person, you can have a program to give them a bill or not. That's, that's one program. But inherent in the, what you know you collect, as he's quoted, 35% of a bill, there's, that's, that's a low number, right? 35% of a collect, collection for service. So that's inherent in that 35% that you're not collecting money from people who can't pay that bill. And that's pretty much medicine, emergency you. medicine in general. Bob. Oh, a few questions relating to the university. Uh, do we respond to both fire and EMS on campus? We do. Okay. And um, do you have any stats on what, what percentage of our, our overall calls are um, campus based? Did we work that out? Yeah. 10%. 10%. 10 percent? A 10 percent. And, and do, does the city receive any reimbursement from the university for that? Not for that. Okay, do, maybe this is a question for you, Jane. Do we, do we have any stats on, on university towns that have big populations of students where the fire department responds to calls on campus about how cities or whether cities get reimbursed? There are a number of cities that have large campuses that do get reimbursed. I believe that we've had a conversation about this, Chief Calderazzo, in the past, and an example might be Palo Alto, which is reimbursed by Stanford University um, in a payment in lieu of taxes, but there are a number of others, and the fire department has that information. Is it? Um, so in Colorado, it's very no. similar. Do you, do you have the answer on that sure. one? Sure. So, uh, first of all, Palo Alto, I can give you some specifics about that. Uh, keep in mind, first of all, Stanford is a private university, of course, but um, they're currently at 23% of the fire department's funding comes from Stanford University under contract. So that's uh, the Palo Alto model. In Fort Collins, which is our closest university town, um, there is no subsidy uh, from the campus for either fire protection services or for uh, EMS, and the EMS system is driven by patient transport fees the way the rest of the community is. Um, but I do know other communities do have systems like that set up. Um, there is word to the wise on that, obviously. When you're entering into that type of financial relationship with another institution, um, it's not always as stable as a funding source as it might seem on the on the front end. And matter of fact, Palo Alto found that out recently where because of the demand in Palo Alto proper versus the campus changed over time, the university approached the city to renegotiate that contract, and that uh, resulted in a net reduction of almost $2 million into the city revenue uh, in Palo Alto, and that caused a redeployment of that entire ALS system. So it's a complicated issue, but I would definitely think that it's something that we should explore to really holistically look at the issue. And Jane, do we want to look at that? The answer that I would give to that is that um, we, have not asked CU recently to consider that payment. I believe in the future we'll be having interesting negotiations with them, um, and it could come up in that context. Great, thank you. Interesting. I could speak what just to the EMS component of that. The students, oh. so if we have a call or a all hazards response that doesn't transport, then that's what we're talking about here. If they're transported, every CU student is required to have either CU's insurance or private insurance. So the transport component for the EMS is a, a separate entity of it. Are we good? Can you scroll back up the questions that we were supposed sure. to answer? In the five minutes we have left? Um, do we have questions? We've, we've asked a lot of questions. Um, I think the question number three, I guess, it, it seems like yes, but does anybody disagree with the further exploration of fire-based advanced life support? Seems like kind of, I don't want to say a no-brainer, but like an obvious thing to explore. Everybody's agreement? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, do we like the, the preliminary master plan focus areas? Are there additional areas we should be considering? Or Can you, f do you have a slip slide? Flip it back yeah. right there. Is 
The only thing that uh, I just want to make sure we're staying ahead of is just watching what's happening with California and the fires, and uh, who knows how bad it's going to get, and hopefully, but anyhow, just that we're ahead of that mm -hmm. piece of it, and we are able to adapt to respond to that, okay. and I guess it's just something I would underscore. Others? Is that anybody? Alan? I just have one question with regards to this. I mean, this isn't quite within this slide, but within the eight wildland firefighters that we have, are all of the city firefighters red carded so they can all jump on if needed for almost all of them? Okay, but, but the majority of the working. So if, if there was some kind of big blow up. On the front range, we have the ability to right. transfer. Okay, yes, cool. ma'am. So red card meaning that if we needed any of the structural firefighters to function as wildland firefighters, we could press them into action for that as well. So we've pretty much got them all up to that level as well. Yeah. Sam and then Mary. <clears throat> so I won't spend much time on it, but I really, really hope that we can move forward with some kind of fire-based ALS. And so hopefully the studies show that it's not a high cost because it, it, we have to think about it as level of service, just as we have heard, <clears throat> and having multiple paramedics deployed around the city rather than a couple of paramedics who might be a long way away is something that I think people might expect right now and not really know what the reality on the ground is versus what they think they might get when they call 911. So I'll leave that there. We don't need to be that right now. Um, we'll wait till we get the numbers. But another thought I had when I was talking with Shannon about a holistic approach, and this is what I think they mean when they're talking about all hazards. In other words, what happens if there is a terrorist attack in Boulder? What happens if there's a chemical accident in Boulder? What happens if the floods come again? You know, how can we better prepare the community to be able to help each other, right? So we saw in the 2013 floods, lots of people lent hands to their neighbors whenever they could, and our emergency services systems were pretty overwhelmed, right, um, because of everything that was going on. And one of the stories to think about um, was related to me um, in these wildfires. Sometimes you call 911 and the response that you get is there's nobody coming. We are fully deployed and can't send somebody to help you, so you will need to fend for yourself. So under the education, prevention, and community partnerships, <laughs> I would like to see if we could expand the, I know we have resilience work going on in the city, and I think that's really good and important. And I think to the extent that resilience effort can tie in with what the fire departments are doing and perhaps with sub-community planning. Because when you have the people convened for thinking about life in their part of town and how they want that to grow and change, Having a, a few sessions where you think about risk and you say, okay, well, where would be meeting points that we want to sign and talk about where people in these events who are capable of lending aid go? How do we know who the doctors and the nurses are in the area? Is there a way to be in touch with them or to give them a place to go so that they can lend a hand? in these situations. So I just wanted to stress that I think there's a big opportunity if we are going forward with sub-community planning to tie in some kind of basic level resilience conversation with that. And I thought that this, um, for a lot of reasons, it actually ties back into you know, how broadly your advanced life support is deployed. So if we did have people in different parts of the city and there were losses of connectivity in the city, so it was harder to transport, you would at least have some resources that are sitting where they might be needed. So Can that's I jump my in thoughts. for a moment here? Well, um, playing off of what Sam just said, as part of what we learned from the flood is that one of the um, sort of chronic issues that 
we have in our community and that every community really has is the issue of social resilience and do people know their neighbors and are they able to call on their neighbors in times of trouble when it's going to be 72 hours before the fire department or the police department is able to respond to this incredible emergency. And as a result of that, the resilience work that we've done over the past several years included the development of a training program for uh, residents called Better Together. Um, that came out of some conversations that we actually had with Wellington, New Zealand, uh, which is one of the 100 resilient cities. And we talked with them, we brought them in, and then we developed our program that has been delivered to a number of groups of residents in the city. Um, we had asked United Way to work on it this year, and they're, they're doing that. We're bringing it back in-house in 2019, and the fire department is very tied into our resilience effort, and I'm hopeful that Better Together can be a real standard of operation, that neighborhoods would be able to receive training around that. So we're very proud of this program, and we hope that we can expand it as you're talking about, Sam. Great. Um, Mary? And then I have Aaron. So in response to the questions, yes, keep going. Where are you going? Um, but I had kind of similar and along the lines of what Sam was saying, where when in reading through what we're going to be talking about next, which is the community benefit, one of the things that was in some of the cities that had that were looked at were resiliency centers. And so I'm wondering if as part of the master plan, there is a kind of identification of where those might be or are those the fire stations and um, and then to kind of foreshadow the conversation for the next um, part of the meeting, you know, is that something that could be a community benefit that could be offered? So that's, um, that's a question and perhaps to have a look at that. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is more of a tactic, a specific program that I, um, I think Longmont put in place a couple of years ago where what they do is they work with Meals on Wheels and they place lock boxes mm -hmm. on um, older people's homes so, and that code is shared with the fire department and emergency um, services so that if they can't come to the door, you, has, you still have access. So if we could put something like that in place in Boulder, that'd be great. Sure. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Aaron. Just a couple additional thoughts. Well, like all my colleagues, I agree with the direction you're moving on ALS. So just the, obviously the cost will matter, but I mean, fundamentally public safety is the um, you know, the, the core purpose of a city government. And um, this, to me, is one of the highest things we could do for public safety is making sure that um, medical professionals are able to get to people um, who are in acute need. So very excited about that. And I just want to echo what my co uh, colleagues have said about resiliency, uh, which I would consider making a focus or encourage considering making a focus area or putting in one of the other focus areas. Because, I mean, you know, prevention is in there that's very good and deployment as well. Of course, we know that these stresses and, and disasters are going to happen. And, and that's what all of what you all do is to figure out how to respond to those best. But that concept of how do we um, bounce back when things go badly, right? Like we do our best to prepare to take care of things quickly, but when we can't, you know, what are the backup plans? And one of the roles that I really appreciate that you all play in the community is that uh, education and partnership and being at the, like, the national night out and the kids love you and you establish those community relationships. And that helps with our social resilience, you know, so that building of the people who know that they can talk to each other, they can talk to the fire department and encourage those community partnerships that make our community more resilient on all those different levels. So I think you're doing great work there um, and I think that could uh, continue could continue to be a focus area. Okay. Cindy, I um, everybody loves the fire department, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody loves the fire. That's what I was saying. See, yeah. the most popular yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was. Someone pointed out to me that in this Bo city of Boulder report, August September, you have your in this, and at the very end, you talk about housing dis density, and the changes of that in the city, and how those kinds of impacts may. Um, affect the fire department. Would you just say a few things about that as well since we're... Sure. There are to... there are some considerations. Um, some of the things that we measure are, you know, we get to 
and, and d there's density of all kinds. So you build up our challenges, then we get to the scene, but then there's a time that we that it takes to actually get to the, the patient itself or, or herself. The, the other issue is access, if they're behind or if there's the, you know, an alley and how we get to get the larger trucks in some spots if they're needed, if the truck is needed. Um, so, so those are the access issues that we're referring to that we have to be mindful of is the ability to get at the patient or get at the nature of the emergency. And the, the more that we build up, that's a challenge. The more that we make it difficult to get in certain areas with vehicles, even small ones, that's a challenge too for us. Um, but it's the stuff that we look at constantly through our fire prevention office anyway as, as planning goes through, you know, all, all the things that come through planning. So we're part of that process, but we just throw it out there because it is something that we look at all the time. Thank you. Thanks. Aaron, and it, just I do appreciate also that you're continuing to evaluate smaller vehicles and where you can deploy those. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Lisa? And then I'm going to jump. Yeah, I'll concur with, with Aaron. There's there's lots of times you can use the smaller vehicles. I guess this this discussion brings up a question about um, the fire department's oversight on planning documents and how much do you get involved in terms of looking at a, a proposed um, development site? We, we have a very good partnership with planning there. So we're involved from the get-go. Okay, um, great. So, yes. Great. Okay, the only thing I would add uh, the, on what Aaron was saying about how popular you are, no, just um, that you guys help us build community and that that's really important to social resiliency. And I was thinking back um, about the mobile home fire we mm -hmm. had a few years ago and that tragedy and how your immediate response was to go out and do a lot more education and uh, right. get out a lot more fire alarms in those communities and anyhow. I totally appreciate that role that you play and the responsiveness, and I assume that that's a big part of the education piece. It of is. That. Mm -hmm. um, so, in addition to the resiliency stuff, keeping those basic systems um, alive and well, I guess, and people educated, I think, is also really key. So, um, thank you. This is very helpful. Um, you've given us an education on BLS and ALS and all of that, and um, we'll look forward to the. The next, I guess, the draft plan. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Are you getting cheesecake? No. Those <laughs> yours right here. Okay. Everybody went to get cheesecake, I'm sure. Okay. So we'll be right back. Um, one, two, three. But we have a quorum, so we're going to just plow ahead and they will okay. hear us in the kitchen and come back. Great. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, Carl Geiler and Phil Kleiser will be uh, presenting the item tonight. We look forward to your discussion and your input. Thanks, Charles. Good evening, City Council members. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about the Community Benefit Project, uh, giving Council an update on the project as well as getting some feedback. Um, 
I should also point out that uh, we had a discussion at planning board on community benefit in August uh, 16th. So our uh, planning board chair, Liz Payton, is here tonight. Should there be any questions about the planning board discussion? So what we're gonna talk about tonight is uh, briefly the project background, uh, moving into the process that's underway, and then talking about the next steps, um, talking about some legal issues related to this project uh, before posing uh, what will be th uh, four questions to the city council. So we realize that there's a lot of information in the packet. Uh, we just wanna point out obviously that we're gonna be checking in with council in the future on this as well as we move forward. So uh, there'll be more uh, touch points. Um, so first I'm gonna start with the, the questions. So the first talks about the types of projects that would be eligible uh, to provide community benefits. We wanted to get uh, your input on that. Uh, the second question relates to the preliminary list of community benefits that have been uh, identified. Uh, there was a request at CAC to combine the first two questions into, into the first discussion, so we've done that tonight. The third question relates to Appendix J. So we talked about this in June. So Appendix J is the map that shows where height modifications can occur uh, in the city of Boulder. Um, if they're not meeting, obviously, the affordable housing or other exemptions. We wanted to raise the question about whether this Appendix J should be modified as part of this process. So the fourth question relates to uh, the public outreach um, or the community engagement that we have proposed. We just wanted to get some feedback from the council on that. So first we're gonna start with just a list of the land use code changes that are, are now underway. Um, the, the latest list that we have, which we'll be sharing with council, is based on the discussion that city council had at the retreat in January of this year. Um, I should point out that we do have a new code amendment specialist that's assisting with these changes. So currently we're working on the community benefit project, you know, updating the site review criteria, um, which we'll talk about tonight. Uh, the large lot, large home discussion related to compatibility in the RE and RR zones. Uh, we're looking to update the use standards table um, related to outdated uses, looking at home occupation, live work uses, um, and changes to the use table that might uh, be able to create uh, 15 minute neighborhoods. Uh, we've been looking at the parking standards and how, um, and how it would mesh with the transportation demand management standards uh, that's underway. Uh, we're also looking at updates to our open space standards uh, within development projects, as well as looking at some new comforts of design standards. Hey, so, Carl, sorry to interrupt, but with that open space standards, is that about changing the, I know one of the things we've talked about is removing disincentives for smaller units. Is that looking at per square foot amounts or what is that about the it, it open could open that up but that's more of an intensity discussion i think we were looking at more of a just qualitative type changes or, and making the open space regulations a little bit easier to implement gotcha so more about the quality of open space rather than the intensity standard correct to, okay right. thank you and, and did did not that come up when we had redevelopment over at like west of broadway um south of Lee Hill, and there were a bunch of single family houses, and at first they were, go it was the old uh, fire training um, site, yeah. and, and we couldn't do some things because of our open space standards. One Isn't thing we're, right? we're yeah, uh, one thing we're looking at is, is Wooner standards, mm -hmm. you know, like shared right. spaces with cars and, and pedestrians. We're looking at rooftop decks. We're looking at green roofs, you know, things like that are not really addressed in the code right now, so we wanted to, 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 to take a look at that. That's great. So we are gonna talk about this in more depth um, at the next study session, so in September on the 25th. Um, there will be a focus on the large lot and large homes discussion at that, at that meeting. So one thing that came out of the, the BVCP update um, from last year was a, an intent to try to identify needed community benefits uh, in different parts of the city um, and actually doing this through a sub area planning process where the benefits would be tailored to, to individual neighborhoods. So this is something that uh, we're, we're aware of and we understand will probably be talked about at the September 25th study session. Uh, it's not without 
precedent that uh, this has already been done before uh, in the 2014 action plan uh, for the, the North Boulder subcommunity plan. It does include several policies um, that identify the intent of getting community benefits for that area. So that's something that we're looking into. So I'm gonna provide a, a brief background on the project. This is something that we, we already discussed in June of this year when the height provision was brought forward um, relative to uh, Appendix J. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this, but originally um, when Phil and I started the project, we were focusing on um, height modifications and attaining um, permanently affordable housing through that process and at the the city council retreat, uh, it was requested that we kind of shift gears and look at the broader array of community benefits and look at other types of triggers. Um, and it, it was requested that we um, extend or make the height provisions permanent. So in June of this year, uh, city council did pass the height provisions, um, which will be in effect until May 31st, 2020. Um, so what you see up on the slide is, is a, what, basically what is Appendix J. These are the areas that um, where you can ask for a height modification. Um, downtown, the 29th Street, Uni Hill, Boulder Junction, the hospital, Fraser Meadows, and Gun Barrel. And there's a portion of North Boulder. So um, this is something that's in effect right now, but we've shifted gears to do the community benefit project. So I'm gonna talk about uh, just the general process moving forward, so what we've been doing is identifying the community benefits, identifying what the program triggers might be, and then doing a, a deeper dive into what, what each of the community benefits are, like really getting the parameters about them, which we're still, we're still doing, and then quantif qual quantifying them, you know, how do you um, equate that to whatever kind of bonus a project might get? Um, that's something that we're gonna have to continue looking at. So, at the beginning of this process, the, you know, obviously the comp plan was was adopted in 2017, the, the latest version. There is a new or a number of policies that relate to community benefit. This is one we're highlighting tonight, 1.11 enhanced community benefit. You can see the underlying portion identifies a number of community benefits and these still remain valid in, in our discussions that we've had with the community. These are the things that we're, we're hearing from the community. So I'm gonna talk about triggers and then kind of two of the approaches that other um, places are, are doing. So triggers in most areas related to community benefit relate to going over the building height uh, of a zone district, going over the density limit, uh, going over a specified floor area limit or floor area ratio, uh, or rezonings where you get a, a greater intensity. Um, so as far as the two options uh, that we've been looking at, there's the menu of options piece and then there's what, what is called community benefit agreements. Uh, we're focusing on the menu of options which would basically be specific standards uh, that would um, be more predictable. Um, this is something that would have to be consistent with state law. Um, state law requires that you know these have to be based on specific standards and there has to be um, decisions that are made that are consistent and fairly applied and our, our city attorney will be discussing this in, in more detail tonight. Um, the second piece is the negotiated agreement. So this is something that typically would not be compliant with state law, but we wanted to highlight it tonight just as some other cities and other states and provinces do this. So Carl, that raises the question for me. How do we get away with state law with our current process? Because it's basically negotiated and unpredictable. That's that's what we hear all the time. I mean, our, our current process is, is based on the site review criteria and it's, it aligns with our, our comp plan. Um, I, you know, they're asking for certain things and it's equivalent to it, but I think this is asking, this is where they're gonna be going beyond. So we have to do that analysis. Carl, as long as we interrupted you. Um, uh, and maybe you get to this later on. Um, uh, on the distinction between menu of options versus community benefits agreement, presumably on a CBA, that's a binding agreement between the, the property owner and the city and, and it's enforceable by the city. Under the menu of options, are you gonna talk about how, once once the menu is developed, how that is enforced? Because obviously we've had a lot of enforcement issues in the past about, about how we, we ensure that whatever boxes are ticked, that we have a legal right to then enforce that. 
Yeah, we don't have that as part of our, our presentation, but it's certainly on our mind. Um, there are examples of when a, a use might change and then it got granted a, a bonus and then other jurisdictions have had to do penalties, like sometimes they have penalty fees. Um, so it depends on the community, but there are some communities that require, you know, a prorated kind of penalty fee that goes into a fund. Um, I mean, this is something that I think is a little further down that we're going to have to look at as we start digging deeper into the community benefits. Our, okay. our attorney's dying to get in. Not dying. Oh. <laughs> uh, looks somewhat interested in speaking to uh, us. Somewhat interested. This part of this discussion is to get at exactly what you're you're getting at, Bob. Uh, we we will tell you when you say, can we ask them to do X? You can ask them, but you can't condition approval on it because you have you can only condition approvals on things that are in the site review criteria. So part of the purpose for this discussion is to expand the site review criteria to make the kind of conditions that people make as promises actual conditions on the development agreement and make them enforceable. If it's just a promise made orally at planning board at council, it's impossible for us to, and we can't let you condition it unless it's in the site review criteria. So we're, that's part of the bigger picture that you're addressing today. So when the community benefit uh, regulations, uh, if, if and when they go into effect, it's likely going to change the site review criteria. Um, so one area of the site review criteria that we already have is called land use intensity modifications. So this is an area of the site review criteria that I, I expect we'll see a, a lot of change. Um, so I wanted to point that out and also just pointing out that um, the site review criteria right now are generally aspirational. They do require high, higher quality development, but the criticism has been that they can be somewhat unpredictable. Um, so the goal through this process is to make the site review criteria more like performance standards, uh, more predictable, uh, maybe more like the form-based code is structured. Um, and we're gonna be focusing mostly on uh, enhanced design, energy efficiency and resiliency as we move forward with making those changes. So before I turn it over to Phil, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, case studies that we looked at. So attachment D contains a list of, of 15 different cities um, that we looked at as part of this project. So I just wanted to kind of go over the, the takeaways from those cities. Uh, you can see most of them are in the state of California. Um, one thing we've noticed is that many benefits that other cities claim or in their communities are actually quite similar to what we already get through the site review process in terms of like building design, streetscape design, um, things of that nature. But are theirs enforceable? I mean, well, the issue we're just talking about? I believe, yeah, they're, they're, they're agreements, so they are enforced. Okay. I was just curious if that's the difference. So um, height, floor area, density are the most common triggers. Uh, affordable housing, sustainable design, publicly accessible open space, space for the arts are, are the most common benefits that we've seen in other communities. Um, one thing to point out is some of the communities we've looked at are, are much larger cities than Boulder, so the bonuses that we're seeing are much higher than what we would get here. I mean, we're talking, you know, two stories potentially. Um, you know, we're, in other communities we're talking 20 stories, 100 feet bonuses. I uh, so just wanted to point that out. Um, as we were talking about, a, a, quite a few of the communities rely on negotiated agreements that would likely not be consistent with Colorado state law. So what we see in other communities like California or in, in communities in Canada, there is provincial or state enabling legislation that allows for these types of negotiated agreements, but they're very loose. There's not a lot of specific standards and we're not recommending going in that direction. Um, if you read the case study on pa Palo Alto, um, they're actually having quite a bit of a community pushback against their process based on the unpredictability and, and issues of fairness. Um, so we just uh, caution you about that. Um, obviously our goal is to be more predictable as we've um, heard in the past. So some of the standouts communities um, that we think uh, might be most helpful for us here um, are Austin, Texas, just not in terms of scale, but just in the, the types of community benefits that they have identified in their community. They have specific measurable metrics that are tied to a use, so a certain amount of use gives you a certain amount of a bonus. So it seems like that would be kind of the best approach. 
Um, Santa Monica also has requirements that are like that that I think would be helpful. And the other reason we, we bring up Santa Monica is just that some of their regulations have a similar scale um, to Boulder. They have FAR limits and height limits that are similar to what we have here. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Phil. Thanks. Phil Kleisler, Comprehensive Planning Division. Thanks for your time. Um, just before this discussion, uh, we handed out um, the planning board summary that went to council a few days ago, um, as well as um, a summary of um, the case study cities along with some information, population and, and cost, housing cost, et cetera, that the uh, planning board suggested that we uh, provide to council during this discussion. Um, and so as Carl mentioned, the comprehensive plan, um, you know, as part of policy 1.11, did identify a suite of community benefits. Some of those were pretty specific, like affordable housing, uh, while others were a little more broad and topic-based, like social services. Um, and so what this project will do is to take that overarching policy direction and apply specific definitions and metrics and criteria to them. Um, and so the third kind of step in this process or, or, or milestone that we'll, we'll look at in this project is kind of defining the specific community benefits once we choose which ones we wanna look at more thoroughly. Um, these are just a few samples that were included in the case studies attachment in your uh, packet uh, this evening. Um, they include the definition as well as the sample metric. What we've seen in the case studies, um, to further elaborate on Carl's points, is um, you know the cities would um, obviously define what it is the use is, but then they also generally have some sort of metric that would be calculated um, dependent on the development request, or at least a process by which to get to that final number. Um, and so Carl did mention the Downtown Austin Density Program, and so they developed a community benefits program um, and I have a chart here, kind of a flow chart that, di that they developed throughout their process. Um, and we're sharing this with council less for the content on here and more about just kind of a node on process. Um, and so what this chart um, generally does is the large box on the center left are what's called the gatekeeper requirements. And so those would be a list of requirements that would be basic eligibility. Do you reside in the, in the correct zone? Um, and then some general requirements like some basic street standards and urban design standards. Um, the next level over, the column over, um, the um, primary use, since these types of projects are generally based on economic studies, what they were finding was that the residential and the non-residential uses were quite different, and so they actually separated those out. And with that, depending on the project type of the primary use, residential or non-residential use, you would then go into looking at what are the available community benefits or public benefits that are in that middle column there. And so in Austin, one of the things that they went through was prioritizing what's most important to the community. And in the case of Austin, that was affordable housing. And so they, they addressed that um, community ambition through this program by requiring that the additional um, requirement for community benefit, at least half of that has, has to be affor affordable housing. And then the remainder of it, the applicant can kind of choose among those community benefits. And so they have things that are pretty, pretty general, like, you know, or pretty um, consistent with other communities, like different types of housing, child care, historic preservation. Um, they have live music, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but um, <laughs> like, does that mean somebody's constantly playing the whole time? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and, and then finally, that final column is the bonus provision. So that says a specific metric of however, the square footage ratio to whatever's requested. And it's hard to see on this, I understand, um, but we wanted to at least show the flow chart and then kind of prep you in that when we start coming back to you and start having a community conversation, you know, this is a very similar um, broad um, flow chart, which we may start using um, in our public and community dialogue in this project. And so the gatekeeper requirements for Boulder may be something along the lines of what type of applications are we looking at? What are the zones that are eligible? The primary use, you know, would probably be pretty similar. You know, the community benefit column would be our list of community benefits that we identify as a city and community. And then lastly, the specific quantified um, 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 bonus amounts. And so that last piece, the quantified bonus amounts, is that kind of last step in the process. Once we identify the community benefits, we define them, we, just, we decide where they're appropriate and not. Um, the, the common method that we have seen in terms of coming up with a calculation um, is through an economic analysis. 
And so what we've done is a very um, initial and preliminary economic analysis that was found in your packet. Um, that analysis had um, basically developed five um, development um, scenario performas um, in the BR1 district, and it made a common set of assumptions, like two acre lots, um, and, and each of the projects, the bonus projects, were requesting a height modification and a density bonus. The intent of this was to at least start the conversation and start understanding a little bit more around what we might expect in the future um, that would come out of, of, of projects using this type of program. And I wanna say that um, it, we will be doing a much larger study and we'll be looking at all of the assumptions um, included in this report you know, prior to running these numbers again. So this is again, very preliminary. Um, the five scenarios that are included in this analysis was a base scenario to see what can we do under our current um, um, uh, conditions. Um, one scenario where an applicant would request a height modification up to 55 feet and a density bonus um, uh, with no community benefits. And so this would be looking at sort of the return, what this is calling the res residual land value if no community benefits were allowed, but we provided that bonus. Two of the scenarios looked at housing, and so both of those with the height and the density bonus. One of them looked at um, on some additional on-site units using the fee and lieu uh, program, and the other looked at federal LIHTC financing. And then finally, the fifth um, scenario looked at what could we expect in terms of affordable commercial space, and so the subsidized um, commercial space. And so the takeaways that we've seen from this very initial analysis is that the economics may support this program, but at least with these assumptions in hand, it, the margins are a bit slim. Um, it's, and, and this is when we're only requiring one community benefit, when in reality we'd likely be looking at more than one. And so I think there's gonna be more work to do here. I think there's also needs to be, as we move forward in the engagement process, some um, conversations around what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So in this case, we asked the consultant, you know, tell us what would be needed in order to make it financially feasible in these scenarios. The consultant in this case came back with, you know, a height modification of 55 feet um, and a density bonus of up to 70 to 80 acres per uh, units per acre. That's a pretty significant increase and it's something that I think we would need to talk through and run the numbers quite a few times um, in the future. Um, what this Still, looked at, I'm sorry, go ahead. Nothing, you are just, you got, I wanted to go back and just say at some point the residual land value, mm -hmm. granted I was reading it late at night, but I could not figure out what that was. But uh, you're in the role, but you, I just wanted to throw that out there as I didn't quite get what we were testing there. And what? Oh. As, a, as a respond to that. I sure, it, I, to me it's an indicator of what makes the purchase of land feasible and what would make a project potentially feasible. We've heard since doing this analysis that there's also some under other indicators out there that we need to be looking at in the future to also give a more complete picture. Um, we do have some folks from housing that have looked at these types of issues in, in a little bit more depth. In depth, so they. Okay, can maybe I'll just wait for you. questions. It's just it's it's partly because I'm not quite sure how you. Anyhow, the mechanics of what you're testing and how you're testing it, I just didn't compute. Yeah. But it sounds really like a useful concept. So we can come back at the end. Can, can I just but, ask a question, yeah. though, about that? In the residual land value, um, in Boulder, we're experiencing uh, a vast increase in what our residual land value is from what people, what it may have been five years ago or 30 years ago. And so I guess when we um, talk about this and we talk about the changing landscape, I guess I, I want some kind of discussion or explanation about where are you basing that, you know, five years ago or today. So for example, in, in the large lots where we have um, people coming in, and I, I'm not gonna get into them, but just as an example, um, buying lots, uh, houses for $600,000 and then scraping them and then selling the next house for 3.45, I would hope we're not basing residual land value on the $3.45 million. Uh, and I, I get it, take out the house value, but um, that lot is becoming ridiculously expensive. And so we need, we'll need to have some kind of explanation and discussion about how that's changed over time and where our median 
um, might be. So maybe we'll just put that on the list of things to circle back to. Did you have a clarifying question yeah, or something? I did. For the list? Phil, you, you mentioned that um, you know, there's a, it works out marginally with one community benefit required, but we're likely to require multiple. I haven't seen that in the analysis that you've done so far. I see a menu of community benefits, but I haven't seen stated in here that we will likely require more than one at, 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 for one project. Can, did I miss something? Maybe that was just an uh, offhand comment of that's what we've been hearing okay. of an expectation of, of probably looking at housing and other things, and, and but that's not something that we're bound to do by any means. Okay, thank you. Can I follow up? <clears throat> um, when Jim, you and I had talked about this before uh, initially, it seemed like the gatekeeper requirement is the, the affordable housing, right? So the certain level, the inclusionary zoning amount and the linkage fee, those are kind of things that occur one way or the other. And so to me, having one community benefit means one beyond the housing component. Although it could be an enhanced housing component, absolutely, right? Absolutely, it might not be a different one, right? right. So, so there's a baseline housing requirement in either case, and then the benefit yeah. one beyond. Okay, um, you, you go ahead, and then we're going to let you get back. I, uh, I, I pre go ahead, though. Um, well, Lisa brought a good point up about escalating land costs. Did you guys, how did you factor in like escalating construction costs? Our, our linkage fees are going up significantly, you know, uh, city fees, all of those things, did you, were they all in the, um, in the analysis? We asked him to look at what would happen with a, a project today if these regulations were in place. And we did have him double check that he was using the correct, you know, the new linkage fees. Um, but that's with today's climate is what he was going off of. Okay, you better keep going because yep. we have lots to talk about. Okay, well, we'll, we'll continue moving on uh, perhaps, um, you know, a little bit about next steps um, and we can circle back to any of this in more detail. Obviously, um, the engagement plan that's included in your packet is really more of a framework at this point. We kind of wanted to get some direction tonight around some of the project parameters and scope and then we'd be flushing that out a little bit more. Um, the engagement techniques we'll discuss later in the conversation. That's question number four. Um, we would like to circle back around with council later, later this year after we do a little bit more outreach just to have a project update with an, with an IP um, followed by a check-in later um, next year as the project continues to be flushed out a bit more. We're anticipating, depending on, this, um, on the scope and feedback we received tonight of possibly completing this project around this time uh, next year, the third quarter of 2019. Um, again, that's kind of dependent on a couple of factors. Um, we would like to, um, Tom requested just a, a few minutes of the council's time this evening to, to go over a few legal issues as well. So I'd like to hand it over to Tom. Thanks. As you embark on this discussion, I wanted to sort of draw some parameters around it. Uh, Carl's already already mentioned Colorado law, which says that if you're, you have to judge a project based on criteria that are in place at the time the application is filed. And we repeat that to you a lot, but it's important to remember in this context, you can't change the rules of the game once they've started the process. So whatever you define has to be written out fairly clearly. You can't just make it adjustable based on the project, based on some decision that it's gonna happen later. Which ones you can apply if they're in the criteria, that's fine. But the criteria have to be expressed and to be, to be defensible, they have to be written before the application is submitted. So that's Colorado law. And there's also a bigger picture in the law of the United States that's kind of traveling down a kind of troubling direction that I wanted you to be aware of. This Kuntz case that I've cited up there was decided in 2013. And it's, a, it's the third of three cases, the other two were Nolan and Dolan, um, that where the Supreme Court has articulated a standard for, for restrict development restrictions. And the basic standard is that the development restrictions have to be, there has to be a nexus between the restrictions and the problem you're trying to solve and the, the restrictions must be proportional to the development. So the Kuntz case is an interesting case because it's, it's a sort of thing which every city does, in fact, I think we do, 
Um, the, the Coons involves a, um, it was a piece of land, 14 acre piece of land in Florida. Um, the, the, it, the guy bought it in 1972. In 1994, he applied for a development permit to develop three, out of a four, three acres out of a 14 acre site. And he agreed as a condition of development to, to uh, grant a uh, conservation easement over the other t uh, 11 acres uh, to the district. It was a water district. The water district turned down that deal and said you have two choices. You can develop one acre and give us 13, or 13.9 it was, or you can spend a bunch of money to, uh, doing wetlands mitigation on our land. And so he sued, and the, the, the defense was that, it, they, that the, the, the district hadn't actually required him to do anything. They had denied his permit. So since there was no requirement, there was no taking. And the, court, the, 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 the Florida court went along with that. And also that it was money, they, he could pay money to get out, so the money, the money alternative uh, prevented a taking. And the Supreme Court said no, that the Nolan and Dolan proportionality requirements applied in both of those circumstances. And um, they went, it went back to the district court, and the district court uh, then found that it was unconstitutional. Since Kuntz was decided, there have been two challenges to inclusionary housing ordinances uh, that I'm aware of. One, San Jose, and the other one, Seattle. Um, Seattle's was dismissed by the district court because um, there were, nobody had actually paid the fee yet or, or done the inclusionary housing. It was a new ordinance, so that nobody had standing. So that'll come back at some point. Um, the, the San Jose one went to the California Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that it wasn't a taking uh, because it was a citywide zoning ordinance, not an administrative regu regulation. And so that it was applied to everybody. And that's a distinction that the courts have made. Uh, when it was appealed to the, to the United States Supreme Court, the court denied um, the, the petition for what we call certiorari. Um, but Justice Thomas concurred. And in his concurring decision, what he said was that they're denying it because the petition wasn't timely filed. But I don't like this distinction between zoning and administrative application. I don't think it makes any sense. And I'm looking for a case where the Supreme Court could decide whether or not that applies. Um, we, you all know the Supreme Court is getting more conservative by the day. Um, and, and the Coons case was a five to, five to four decision in 2013. Probably would be six three today, and after Judge Kavanaugh gets confirmed, maybe seven to two. Um, that's the direction the court's going. So I wanted to just provide some caution that as you have these conversations about community benefit application, it would be really helpful if we identified the problem that we're trying to address, and that is the impact of development on our community and how the particular community benefit helps that or, uh, or helps address that. And all of the things in the list, I think I could rationally justify but it would be really helpful if we had somebody who was a consultant who was saying that. So as, as you come down the line, you know, so for, for example, even the, the, perhaps the furthest stretch is arts or music space. You could have someone do an analysis and say, what kind of arts do you need in a community to make a viable community if you have X amount of development? And, and I, I think there's, there is some nexus there, but as you go along these, this, have this conversation, I'd like to keep that in the back of your mind, that there, that there are constitutional constrictions, that those constrictions are likely to get more strict over the coming years as our Supreme Court gets more conservative, and that um, it would be best if we had something that was absolutely defensible. Now, right now, our inclusionary housing ordinance is absolutely defensible based on prior precedent throughout the country that it is a, an, it is a citywide zoning regulation. But as I said, Justice Thomas doesn't think that's a good distinction, and Justice Thomas is in the majority of the Supreme Court in a lot of cases lately. That's all I wanted to add. Good. So what I'm hearing from you then is that we can impose uh, arbitrary community benefit uh, requirements. So, that, for example, if we thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if they gave out candy because candy is fun and people enjoy it, um, and so they impose that, <laughs> right? And so we imposed a requirement that you have to give out candy as a community benefit, but there would be no way to make a nexus to the lack of candy from development. And it, I, I no, think you could my, make a case. I, I, so what my, my caution is we should go carefully mm -hmm. and, and identify the nexus. I'm not, Kansas is, is, is purposely, and I know you're making an absurd 
example, but the argument, you could develop an argument that in a, in a city that's rapidly densifying, having candy available for children who have no other place to go might be a, I mean, that's the kind of argument that you could develop. I, I, I wouldn't like to have to make that argument in court. Uh, and, and our job is to make what you do defensible. So yes, there are some boundaries we probably couldn't cross. I'd just like you to understand that there are limits and that we'd really want to look and make sure that we could, could articulate a clear nexus. Okay. You're very good. Uh, but uh, so maybe the, the point is just that whatever community benefit requirements we're imposing, they need to be because there's a need in the community and that need is um, perhaps exacerbated by new development. Yes, I, 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 my preference would be if identified the need that you were tr trying to solve, the problem that you were trying to solve as you yep. did the nexus itself. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the discussion portion of the meeting. So um, like we said, we combined uh, questions one and two. Uh, we wanted to tee up each question before uh, council speaks to it. So um, obviously we're back to what type of projects would have to include community benefit. We talked about the triggers, so over the height limit was one, over FAR or at a lower threshold was another. Um, over the density limit was the third, and then rezonings that had intens additional intensity was the fourth. Um, so staff's recommendation was to basically focus on. Carl, can I interrupt you? Because I think actually CAC's intention was for you to visit these questions in that order, not to have the discussion simultaneous. Okay, we, we can just Which, start with one mayor's, then. Mayor's pleasure. But, uh, but I'm confused by what it is, because I wasn't at CAC. Well, well just that, that we would deal with that first question and then, so about do we agree with the pros pro proposed project features, and then second, we would deal with the preliminary list of community benefits, okay. rather than do, talking about them both at the same okay. time. Okay, just that we that. do it in that order. Okay, yeah, yeah okay. we can do that. But I guess I want to pause and, because um, this is our discussion, so I guess we have, we have a few questions, but also Liz Payton's here, and I guess I, for one, I mean, if, why don't you come down and join us and maybe, um, as part of our deliberations, hearing what the planning board, other, otherwise we'll have to read all these notes again, um, had to say on each one. Uh, Jim, you don't have to leave. We have room. We'll just squeeze somebody else in. Okay. Um, uh, do folks want to hear planning board's thoughts on that before we wax poetic? And at some point I want to get back to the, the question we had earlier, but... Yeah. Do you want to weigh forth uh, weigh, uh, what the planning board had to say about question number one? Yeah, sure. Um, we spent some time. And introduce yourself. If okay, you I'm sorry. I'm Liz Payton. I'm the chair of the planning board. And um, we did uh, agree with this list that the um, staff offered height, FAR, density, and rezonings. And one of the issues that we talked about a fair amount that um, I don't see it up here, and I don't know if you guys have spent any time thinking about it, but um, we see projects in which the density of a site can be sort of modified depending on whether the developer is going to um, dedicate the streets and right-of-way to the city or not. If they are going to dedicate it to the city, then they have less developable area, and so they can their density is reduced. If they um, are going to assume responsibility for the right of way and the streets and the sidewalks, then they count that additional area in their density calculations. And so it can vary from project to project. And for us, having a baseline um, above which additional height FAR density rezoning would then result in some community benefit. It was tricky for us to figure that out without having that baseline. So that was something that I don't know if you guys have spent any time on or if staff wants to talk about that at all, but um, it was something we gave staff some suggestion to get that resolved, so. Great, that's a wrinkle I hadn't thought of. <laughs> Okay, um, in answer to question number one, proposed project features, are there others? Are those the right ones? Can, can I suggest yeah. just one more? It, 
can do we want Liz to speak to what planning board did on the second one and then start a discussion or? Oh, uh, are we gonna? I, I don't care either way. It was just a question. To Liz's last point, I mean, I think starting with a baseline would be very helpful so you know kind of you can compare what you're getting. And so I don't know um, how we address that, but no, we haven't thought about it. Mm -hmm. You guys. <laughs> well, well, it did come up previously, um, and I forget if it was during the comp plan update or when it was, but it came up before. Yeah, but we didn't really deal with it a whole no, lot. We didn't. Uh, I, I mean, I can offer a little bit of background if I think you all remember. I mean, it came before planning board when I was on it maybe three years ago as a potential code amendment to change the standards of whether the streets are still included in developable potential if they're deeded to the city. The planning board voted that yes, it should change, and then it came back and it was voted in contrary, no, it shouldn't. And then I don't believe city council took an action on it. So as of right now, um, you do reduce your developable potential when you um, hand right of way over to the city. And I don't think there's any plans on trying to change that right now. Do I have that right? That's correct. Um, give one sentence of explanation of the rationale. So if somebody gives us the right of ways, they can develop less. Is that so, an, a disincentive? Where this comes into play is that there's some flexibility depending on the, the development and how many units they're serving on what the width of the right of way can be. And this is allowed through the design and construction standards. Um, so there's some flexibility about whether you have dedicated right of way that includes the tree lawns, the sidewalks and the, the street width and the on-street parking within it. That's typically in city right of way and doesn't count towards the density of a project. But there are some scenarios where a developer could reduce that down and put the sidewalks, tree lawns in public access easement. So it's actually, if it's in an easement, it's actually part of the property. So it really only comes up with zones that determine their density by lot area. So when they do that, they have a higher amount of lot area, so they get more units that way. Um, if it's a zone that does open space, it's a different matter because mm -hmm. open space doesn't count towards the project if it's in an easement. Right. So and I think the board saw that as a form of a benefit, and if that's the way that we're gonna continue to administer the regulations, then we should talk about getting a community benefit for that. Okay, all you planning board nerds. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the essential difference between open space per dwelling unit and dwelling unit per acre is something that I was hoping that we would come back to in the site plan review criteria portion that was at the beginning and try and get that uniform so that we don't have these two different flavors of the way that we assess intensity on lots. So one comment from a planning board kind of nerd is that that's something that we would hope to get kind of worked through as part of the overall package of um, <clears throat> what we've asked staff to help with in this council. The other piece, as far as the dedication goes, I agree with Aaron. I think we kind of determined that we weren't going to try and change where we are on that right now um, because we didn't get planning board advance at the council. Is that correct? Yeah, on the second vote. Well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> right. Okay, well, at the very least, simplifying something that is barely understandable, I think is a good thing. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I'm just gonna throw that there. Yes, let's fix that so that we have a, a, a clearer baseline. Does anybody disagree with that? No. Okay, but in terms of those being the proposed project features, since nobody seems to have a lot of thoughts on they must be the right ones, do you, or do you have? I do have a thought. Well, so I think part of the, um, I agree with you, Sam, that we should clarify those different development standards. It would be great to, to, to combine those um, going forward. And, and to me, the, the fundamental purpose there, other than reducing confusion, um, is to, to uh, not encourage fewer larger units, right? I think we get more affordability when we have smaller units. And so I, I would very much like to see our regulations move in the direction of encouraging smaller units rather than larger ones. And so to that same point, one of your um, 
things eligible for community benefit triggers is an increase in density, and density strictly defined here is an increase in the number of units, correct? So I would very much like for us to leave the triggers at height and floor area ratio. So because if you want a bigger project, you should provide additional community benefit. If you want a taller project, you should provide more community benefit. If you want more units within the same footprint, to me, that should not be a requirement for community benefit because that's a better project for the city. It means more smaller units. So I, I would very much like to stick to the total square footage and the height for this. Yes. Wait, and so that means take density out? So take density out. Okay. So in that example that you just gave, the last one, where you put in more units, do you have thoughts about parking and how you address that? Because a lot of times, now, if you're adding more units, then we require more parking requirements. So, well, I think you you would you'd have to deal with that absolutely, right. but that would be a separate question for whether it's a trigger for community benefit requirement. You would have to provide more parking if you had fewer units. That's okay, but I mean, maybe you get a you bigger more park. more units if you had more units. Right. If you had more units. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. May I? I guess I would just like to clarify on that as well because. To me, more density is more people, more impact on the community. So you, I get totally where you're going f from with smaller units, and so it could be more affordable technically, but there's also more strain on the infrastructure. So I kind of feel like it maybe evens out. I, I don't know. It's just a thought. Well, that's why I was asking this question. So if you, if you do get more um, strain, then maybe you can relieve that strain by um, requiring less parking and incentivizing people to have eco-pass or bikes or have a bus stop in front of the building or something like that. So that's where I was going. That's a great point. I mean, enhanced trans travel demand management, yeah. if there's yeah. higher density, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But. I, I, think, I, I think if you have this exact same size project, that if there are more units that are smaller, that we're better off as a city. And, yeah, and I was just thinking that if you require more parking, then it gets pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to do underground parking. So I, if we were trying to get more affordable units. Okay, I see a lot of hands. We're going Jill, Mary, Sam. Maybe Charles or one of you could uh, corroborate this, but to Aaron's point of same size, same volume, um, and just in the difference of units, my understanding is that building more units is more expensive also, um, that the project cost usually goes up with that density within the same volume. And so, you know, it, it's one more reason, I think, that your proposal makes a lot of sense if we're further adding cost here. Wait, are you, is that a question? Well, it's a, I thought it was a question. Kitchens, you have bathrooms. Sure, I mean, I think it drives material costs up, and again, parking, especially if it's gonna be structured, you know, really contributes to the overall cost. Mary? So what I'm hearing in the in the previous exchange um, among Aaron and Mirabai and um, Lisa was that the, that density would require a different community benefit. So that would be the enhanced TDM. And that was something that was in the matrix that was provided by planning board, I don't know, eons ago. But that was one of the, the community benefits. Um, so it sh it, I think it should be part of the, the triggers, but what, how you provide a benefit because of that is different from the others, perhaps. Sam and Bob? Yeah, I think Mary's got this exactly right, um, that uh, density does have an upside, which is more, um, less expensive units, uh, but it also has some potential downsides, and if they're mitigated, then those downside mitigation is community benefit. So we've ended up with more people housed, presumably at a lower cost, but we have taken measures um, that may have a cost to them, 
to make certain that on balance it's a positive for the community. And so I would like to keep density as a trigger, but I'd like to, when we move into the second part of this, talk about whether there's a limited range of things that we might want to have as community benefits that we might require for density. Because I don't think, to your point, Aaron, that public art uh, would be necessarily have the same nexus that TDM would. And so getting a longer lasting TDM program for higher density might be appropriate where some of the others may not have the nexus. And if I could just kind of jump in on this one and add an additional, I mean, this is part of the next question, but um, perhaps a labor requirement that I saw in some of the studies that were done where um, it would be a community benefit to require the rental units to go to folks that work in the city. Okay. Did you want to respond? Did you want to go? Oh, to I'm sorry. Yeah. I think I think the Sam and Mary staff started to ask my answer my question, which is, um, is there going to be a correlation? In other words, we've got a list above, which is either three things or four things, depending on how this discussion turns out, and then we've got a list of of benefits, and that list may may grow, but there may be a correlation between some of the benefits and some of the um, um, uh, what are we calling these? So program features, triggers. the triggers. In other words, all everything on the bottom part of the page won't necessarily entitle someone to everything on the top part. There may be some correlations. Well, and that goes to Tom's request that we keep in mind those nexus. Right. Okay. That's the nexi. Nexus. <laughs> nexus. Nexus. I. Well, okay. Oh, go ahead. Can I? Yeah. So. Mary and Sam, those are, those are good points. The, I, I, although I think of those more as mitigations rather than community benefits. I mean, I absolutely agree with enhanced mitigation, particularly TDM for higher density. And so if we want to frame it that way, um, that's fine. Um, I just, but I would see it as very different from, um, you know, uh, requiring them to provide affordable commercial space because they had more units in the same footprint. That doesn't really make sense to me. but. If we could maybe look at maybe there's a separate set that are of mitigation slash benefits that go with them potentially. So I'm going to agree with where we're headed with this conversation because I do think in a lot of places we're getting big units when we think smaller makes more sense. And so I do think we want to set ourselves up um, for that, but recognizing there are some downsides that we want to mit mitigate. Right. So I guess where we're headed, let's explore and see if uh, what's the best way to get there. Um, and uh, anyhow, I'm thinking of the flow chart from Austin, and I'm not quite sure how that works. But anyhow, we might have one, more than one flow chart. Um, but I do think it's time to make sure we're not incentivizing larger units. Right. So. so just a coda to that is that's another reason to get rid of the uh, open space per dwelling unit standard is because mm -hmm. that strongly incentivizes the larger units. So I, just to put a period and exclamation point on what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. If we can work that into this project, that would be fantastic. Yep. Yep. It's tripped us up before. Yeah. Okay. I say let's move on to question number two. Do you want to weigh forth on this? Or did you want to frame something? Uh, then you go. Obviously, we, we've we have a long list of community benefits that's in the memo, so we weren't able to go through each of those in, in the presentation. So we have some slides of each with the different options if, if there's a focus on any of those, but for the sake of time, we've, we've not gone into that, but that's, that's, that's basically You're it. gonna show us what aff affordable commercial space looks like? Well, just the different options that we outlined, um, putting a maximum rent on the space for commercial retail space. And this is something that housing division's working on currently um, that they are kind of putting forward through a process right now that's looking at subsidized um, commercial spaces that would be uh, subsidized at 75% of market value. Um, and that would also have to take into account some of the, the sales and some of the other items. And again, housing is here if, if you wanted to get into any of the weeds on, on that particular item. Wait, how many, okay, so we have about an hour and we have th three questions. Three questions to ask. I don't, I don't care if we, people want to pause and go into the weeds. I have a question on, well, on yeah, the, these are the main. But but and we're we're in a process question here. Do you guys want more details under each of these, or do you want to just wave forth as is, and then we can yeah. get to you? I think we're. 
I think waiting for as is is fine. Um, if we want more details or we get into the weeds and we want to pop to a slide that has more information, maybe that's the way to do it. Anybody disagree? Or do, okay. What's your question? So when when I was reading the memo and um, we were talking about affordable commercial space and putting a rent cap on that, is that is that legal in Colorado? The rent on commercial. Yeah, the rent control prohibition only applies to residential. Just to residential. Wait, 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 wait. We could do rent control on a, on commercial. Yeah. That's what I was asking. Yeah. Well, I just want you to say it again. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Prohibition says residential units. Yep. Hmm. That's useful to know. Yeah, that, and that's why I brought it. That's why you brought it up. Thank you. Is there a loophole where we can get people to live and work there so we can keep <laughs> Not if you refer to it as a loophole, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay, so we have a pre preliminary list of community benefits. What did Planning Board have to say about this? Um, for the most part, we agreed with staff's list there. Um, there was a little bit of um, doubt about the affordable commercial retail, how that would work, but um, I think people supported it. They were just for example, didn't know about the uh, rent control option. Um, we talked about uh, those four, and then there was less um, enthusiasm for the other ones on the right side there, but um, at the end of the meeting, we talked a little bit about the possibility of providing childcare or daycare, and that would be under social services. Um, because, you know, if affordable housing is the primary benefit that folks are looking at, um, a really nice sort of synergy could happen with um, daycares, affordable daycare, or some quality um, family sort of oriented benefits. But for the most part, we did agree with what staff has on the left there. But, yeah. yeah. Did you talk about design standards? We did talk about design standards, but not for taller, larger buildings necessarily, just enhanced design. And we didn't think that should be part of the this community benefit project, but it should just be something that's expected of all the buildings. Exactly. So, um, but let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm thinking about Austin's flow chart, where mm -hmm. bonus, you wanna do a little peaked roof, we'll let you go up a couple feet or whatever. I made up that bonus, but you know what I mean? Um, would any of the ones on the, you said the left, but on my right. Um, right, on the right, uh, something like a, you know, a little extra feet for a um, gable or something like that. That was the kind of thing we considered as enhanced design and that that would be tr dealt with outside of this community benefit. Not as a bonus. Right. Huh, okay. So. Uh, wait. Well, I'm sorry, we have a lot of good, Bob. There's a question for Liz on, on, your, on your comment on daycare. One of the things I, I guess I struggle with a little bit is a lot of these things are, are infrastructure improvements or changes. In other words, it happens when it gets built and it's done. They check the box, they either did it or they didn't. And when we get into things like daycare or movie theaters, um, there becomes an operational component, right? In other words, if, if the requirement is you shall build a movie theater, but maybe someone will operate it or not. This is an entirely hypothetical question, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or a daycare center. Uh -huh. um, then, then it becomes more difficult, right, from an enforcement standpoint, because then you get into all sorts of messes about how do you operate it and what does it cost and what if you can't find an operator and what if it goes out of business and so on and so forth. So uh, I guess this is a bit of a question for anybody who wants to answer it. Don't, don't we need to primarily focus on infrastructure benefits that happen at a point in time and exist forever as opposed to operational benefits? Well, uh, TDM would fall into the same category as this as so, so. child care sort of thing. And, <laughs> and um, th one of the things, looking at all of the case studies, the child care benefit was one that showed up in lots and lots of cities. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how they implement that, but it was, doable it must have been because it shows up quite often so the gym knows the answer well <laughs> yeah i think putting standards to it would be um most important because when i read the child care standards and a lot of the case studies 
you know, for how long are you supposed to operate it. Um, in Austin, for example, if the benefit that you're providing is a live music venue, you have to operate it continuously for 10 years. It can't be uh, vacant for more than 180 days, otherwise there's penalties that are assigned that go back into the city's affordable housing fund. Did I get that right? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, and I was just cautionary note, this is an example of every community benefit you identify that you want to be part of this program, you have to give a lot of scrutiny to what are the rules that are going to apply to that because a very valuable uh, commodity, that being the additional height, intensity, whatever, is being granted to a project. So you want to, and of course the market's going to gravitate towards the path of least resistance. So you want to make sure you set the rules really well. What we did in, in Austin, um, I say we because I was involved in creating this thing, um, in addition to setting the rules in terms of like Charles summarized, and we even, Austin being live music capital of the world, there were arguments like, well, what if it's a cover band? Does that count? Um, uh, 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 um, doesn't it need to be a singer-songwriter? Um, so, uh, literally. Um, but, um, but in addition to setting all those rules, you know, okay. what qualifies as this kind of a space, we also had a thing like, what happens if after 10 years, eight years, whatever, the project can no longer find viable tenant tenants that meet that criteria? Area. Obviously, you can't saw a story off a building at that point and say you got that story because you provided a space that's no longer providing this benefit. The way we handled that was um, there was a cash in lieu option that was almost always available, um, um, cash in lieu, which would go to affordable housing. And we basically said if this benefit ceases to exist at a period in time, at that point, the owner of the project would have to pay the value, the cash in lieu value that they avoided paying up front um, by providing this community benefit that no longer exists. So you would pay the cash in lieu value in today's value, you know, in other words, it would be updated over time. You would have to, in essence, reimburse the city for um, what you would have had to pay up front had you just provided cash in lieu instead of this benefit that no longer exists. And then did you amortize that? In other words, if they did eight out of 10 years, they'd only have to pay one, one fifth? Okay. And and has that um, has that proved uh, as an incentive to keep that live music going? I mean, well, actually, I don't. Um, have there been any failures? The there? program is relatively young in Austin, okay. and I'm not, I'm not aware. Obviously, I've been out of the picture there for two years, but um, I'm not aware of any situations where we actually have had to invoke this this provision of of an essence of collecting. It seems like somebody. it would be an incentive to keep. Uh, yeah, Whatever. it's certainly a lot simpler if the community benefit is something that is just permanent, um, that's not going away. You don't have to worry about this. But where you mm -hmm. have temporal or potentially temporal community benefits, this is something you need to think about. We have some questions over here. Yeah, uh, Jim, well, first of all, is there statistics on how many of them were cover bands? Because that was... <laughs> Now the, so I wonder, could we, uh, could we combine something like this with an affordable commercial requirement? Could you have something like, well, if, if you rent to a, a list of social services like a child care or a homeless services provider, then you can charge the rent that you can you know, work out with that provider. If it's not to one of those, then you have to rent at 75% of market rate. If it's not to one of those kind of community benefit uses, which would then make it a little more flexible. Um, you know, could, could we, what do you all think of something, sort of possibility? I think you do that. I mean, obviously that, that probably the administration component of that kind of a program gets a little more complex. Um, um, but is it more complicated than just the affordable commercial by itself? I mean, a little bit more complicated, but is the main complication the affordable commercial program? Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's doable, the way you describe it. Okay, that's a thought to do. Well, and it also might matter how many different options. I mean, if all we have to do is implement an affordable commercial program, then we can get really good at that, as opposed to worrying about cover bands, right. which is a whole other art, I'm sure. But I guess, how, in terms of setting cash in lieu as sort of uh, the other option that was always a path, do we need to, do we have to set that up no matter what? Um, or, because my question is really not making it too attractive to, to take cash in lieu from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering, how do you make it so that's not the attractive choice, but it's the backup enforcement mechanism? Does that, is, does that make sense? 
Yeah, it makes sense. I think it's just how you structure the regulations and you know the, the standards. Just make it high, is that what you're saying? Well, like for example, in Austin, um, it was kind of used as a penalty. So I think well, yeah. that's the way that you construct I mean, the It doesn't have to be an option up front. Right. Looking back at what we did, we, we, and there was a lot of debate around this issue as to whether we, there should even be a cash and loot component or whether we should just require residential projects to provide on-site units. There was a whole debate around that and that fundamentally is in some ways a public policy question. The way it landed at the end of the day on that was projects, they had, they had to provide an affordable housing benefit. At least 50% of the additional value they derived, whether it was FAR or stories or whatever, had to be earned, if you will, with an affordable housing benefit. They could, they could fulfill that benefit, either providing on-site or a cash in lieu. Now, as it turned out, what we learned was the way we calibrated it, you know, we had a certain dollar for a cash in lieu or a certain number of units of affordable housing. We learned from experience that the way we had set it up, cash in lieu was more attractive. That was the sort of path of least resistance that the market took. So the first projects that came through, we were getting consistently cash in lieu instead of um, on-site affordable units. That is a, that's a policy question as to whether you want to do that. You can, you can set up the economics so that you incentivize people to go into on-site units. In other words, you make it more expensive to pay the cash in lieu than it would cost the project to build on-site units. That's just a matter of calibrating the economics a certain way. Okay, Bob, and then we're going to make sure we answer this yeah, question. Yeah, follow-up question for Tom. If we have a cash in lieu alternative, whether it's affordable housing or some of these other benefits, um, does that start to get into Colorado law problems? In other words, if, if somebody wants something and they can just write us a check to get that thing, is there a, what's the nexus that we can point to? Well, the, the, so the current nexus for affordable housing is we use the... Yeah. Housing's easy. So, so let's say somebody wants a taller building, can they just write us a million dollar check? To satisfy the nexus, you'd have to dedicate the money to addressing the problems that you're trying to solve. Which is what we did. That money came in and was dedicated to into an affordable housing trust fund, like sort of like we have here. But so does, does a taller building cause you know, unaffordability? I guess I'm, I'm trying to, I'm grappling. If somebody wants to build a five-story building instead of a three-story building, they write us a million-dollar check, how will we be solving affordability? I mean, how, how is that, that extra two stories causing an affordability problem that we're then fixing with the money? How does a tall building cause affordability problems? So, so the, um, the argument is that you, the more you build, the, the, the higher the prices go, which is counterintuitive, but somewhat true here. And so you, you, um, you're, you're addressing that with um, dollars that go to provide affordable housing for those who can't li afford to live in the units that you're building, which is what the market's demanding. So does, does the money always, well, this is quite a question for you, Jim, does the money always go to affordable housing, regardless of whatever they're buying out of, is that where the money goes? Could. It's those. In Austin, I mean, I just want to wonder. Yes. Okay. If you paid cash in lieu as in, in order to fulfill your obligation via this program, it went to affordable housing. But, but Bob, Wait, what about the live to. music? Okay. Sorry. So, oh, sorry. So I think there's a reason that you separate commercial from residential, because as we've shown with the Nexus study, um, additional height that goes to commercial will have a impact on affordability. And then you can come back into when we build housing, <clears throat> we already have kind of a standard within zoning that there will be 20% of that will go to housing. So you can make the argument that if they're going taller, um, and they don't want to provide some other benefit, or I think what Jim said is they use it as a penalty. If they promise something and something doesn't come to reduce the impact on the community of the taller building, then you can put it towards affordable housing and still have it be useful. Does that? Yeah, I was, I was thinking some of these. These other benefits, like art, let's just, so let's say the community benefit is supposed to be art, and for some reason there's a failure there. I mean, how does how does the money how does paying money towards affordable housing fix the well, failure? It could go to the art program then. I suppose it could go to the art program. So I, I guess that was the question I was trying to direct to Tom: is does there have to be a nexus of the cash um, to that ties to the benefit that was supposed to be provided? I, I don't know that that's true. I, there, I haven't seen any case law that requires it. Uh, I think it's kind of an open question. I, I, I think that you're on firmer ground the more closely you tie it to the problem you're trying to solve. And art's probably the one of the harder ones to tie it to. So, so oh, go ahead. 
Well, just, so I'll just throw out to the extent that we have cash penalties, I would propose that they go in funds that were dedicated to whatever the community benefit is that they're failing to provide. So if, if we go that route, that would be my recommendation. Just okay, and so that's something I guess to be determined or to think about, but in terms of the, that list, is that the right list? Um, are there edits to that list? Mary. I had a question um, from the previous conversation that we were having. You said that, Jim, you said that it's just a matter of setting up the economics to provide the incentive that you, to provide on-site affordable housing or not. Um, that's not the case in Colorado because of the lack of ability to have rent control. So, because a lot of, or it, it does, I guess my question is, does Austin have um, that limitation where you can't have rent control because we can't do it, we can't set those economics here? The way um, Texas law is written, and I'm operating, I'm no longer a practicing lawyer, so, and I'm operating from memory here, but um, um, is that uh, if it is part of in essence, an incentive or bonus program, you can uh, place restrictions on uh, rental residential, um, but it cannot be a feature of your sort of base zoning requirements. But if it's part of a, an incentive program, which this was, um, you can do that, which is what allowed us to do this. And I'd like to also make one comment, if I may. Um, the analysis in the packet was really looking at what's what's likely to be um, um, feasible for a developer to look at, which is a little bit different than the Nexus study. And so I think the two may complement each other, but you know, the, the first might say, what, to what extent might this program be successful? The other would say, w the, give the legal ground by which to set that standard. Is that, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna answer the question. Sorry, we're moving on to this question. I'm gonna answer this question. So in terms of arts and cultural uses, I guess one thing I don't see is if you're gonna like build a high rise, then you gotta have a pocket park next to it so all the people that live there have some open space. Is that encompassed in arts and culture or social services or, but that seems to me public, that's the other benefits is a publicly accessible open common space. So what does it mean to be another benefit it, um, as opposed to initial program focus? I think in the memo we were, we were making a recommendation that we should be focusing and maybe on a, a more limited number of benefits to kind of focus on the ones that are the most important and, and see how the program goes. And then if there's, a, uh, if it's successful, then looking at other benefits. So we were suggesting in the memo an emphasis on affordable housing, affordable commercial rental space, and arts and cultural uses. And I, I think based on the planning board discussion on childcare, we had moved the social services over. So we were placing a higher precedence on the four on the left. Okay, I guess I for one, but to me it's a social, well anyhow, um, this idea of contributing to and maybe it's covered enough in the open space. I wish we didn't use open space in so many different ways in this town. I think it does not do us. Okay. But to me, to me, um, for instance, density is a good thing, but probably needs to be offset, offset by increased amenities. Like you need to have access to open space if you're gonna build a dense development. And so maybe that's already accommodated in our our site review, but if it's not, I guess I would put that in the left column. Although, to me, cultural and social involve public spaces um, for people to enjoy together. Um, so that's one thought I have. Answer the question, people. Are you gonna answer the I, question? I have okay. a question, I have a question, sorry. But in there, and it's come up before us in, in the past, has to do with landmarking. And we had a, a great example up on the hill. 747 14th Street, where we had a, a house that uh, we, the city, wanted to landmark, and it was on a relatively large lot. What we ended up doing was um, landmarking it, but then we also allowed subdivision of that lot so that somebody could build 
another house. And so we were able to preserve that landmark structure and um, it wasn't gonna, I don't know if that was permanently affordable, but here's a, a case where you might be able to get two benefits at one time, where you have a small house that is historical and that we're, we can incent the landowner to um, preserve that house and landmark it while at the same time being able to subdivide their lot so that they could build um, build a, you know, a larger house or a more modern house. But that way you, you get two benefits, you, you preserve it. And we've had over the last 10 years a lot of really cool um, smaller houses that represent different parts of our history and things like that. Right. So that have been destroyed because we didn't have that incentive program. And so I'm wondering if we does so it fit here though, or there? does it fit on the list of things we want to try you to? You know, we had, we had contemplated historic preservation, but we, we do get a lot of landmarkings through the site review process, you know, by tying to the comp land. But I think your idea is, is different than a typical site review, and I think we should consider that. Yeah, I'd just like to keep it on the list since this is just a, or put it on the list since this is a uh, study session. And I totally agree with you. If you're going to increase density, you've got to have density relief. Okay, so how about this? We're going to go around the circle. If anybody has anything to add, it's your chance to add it, and then we're going to move on to the next question. Quick okay. convo on, on Lisa's thing, though. That can also potentially fit in the large lots, so, you know, in terms of when you can... Right, but some, some of these... Maybe both, I yeah. don't know. Okay, great. Here's your chance. Who's ready to go? Mary's ready to go. And then well, you're not going to like this, but I have another question. No. <laughs> God. Okay, no, have, have at it. So with arts and culture... That seems to me that it would have to be something that would be um, fleshed out in terms of, you know, I mean, think yes, <laughs> and and how there was a whole bunch of backlash on that that particular um, piece of art, and you know, what constitutes art, and I mean, one person's art is another person's. Nightmare. Is this one of is is this one so, of those that you have another slide on that fleshes it out? Did you flesh this one out at all? We we did develop some options. I know planning board talked. Maybe there were some planning board members that talked about this, and and I think they landed more along the lines less about public art and more about providing brick and mortar space for people to make a livelihood in in that field. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And then. Um, Okay, so I will say that um, this is the right list, although I would put the social services and critical needs above arts and culture, sorry, Matt. But, um, and I would add onto the, the, that list to childcare, I would add things like the resiliency centers that we were talking about earlier, um, where there's a place that people can go in case of whatever kind of disaster that might happen. So that's that. And then just kind of thinking ahead in terms of the enhanced design, one of the things that we never, ever, ever get, e even though the charter allows it, is to get belfries, spires, and cupolas. And I think that the reason that we don't get those is because they have no monetary um, payback. So that could potentially, in terms of enhanced building design, could be something that would be a community benefit. Mirabai, we're just gonna go around, no? Bob. Um, to the extent that um, I thought I heard you say that you're going to focus on the left-hand column first, and then the phase two is going to be the right-hand column. I guess I, if that's if I understood that right, I disagree with that, for the, for the reasons that have started to be said, which is I think Mary, you know Mary made a good point about design standards. Dan made a good point about common space. I would actually include mobility in that. So I um, I think this is a good list of eight. I actually agree with Lisa that to add a ninth relating to historical preservation. But I wouldn't agree to the phasing, let's do these first and see how it works, then doing the rest of these. Because I think the ones on the right, many of them are just as important as the one on the left. So that's my feedback. Cindy. I think I'd kind of go along with those as well. Um, and I'd like 
the environmentally enhanced design. I think that's important. So I'll just leave it at that. Hey, I'm curious. What do you mean by that? What does that mean to you? The environmentally enhanced design, just what Mary was talking about. Okay, so so I would just it's, it's aesthetics said. we're talking about, not yep. the environment. Okay. Yep. So a few things. I, I feel like environmentally enhanced design means something else to me. It means net zero buildings or higher efficiency buildings where new design standards could mean cupolas and, and things of that nature. So uh, whatever, I don't care what buckets they're captured in. I have a, uh, a thought that net zero buildings, you know, anything above and beyond what code requires would also be one that I'd like to have available on the list. Um, whatever we do a couple is. Um, you know, the, the challenge with uh, architectural flourishes is a lot of times they depend on the quality of the architect. And it's awfully hard to put criteria into place that really define that. And I know depending on where the building is, it may get more or less review of that. So I would also say that I really like the way that Austin has looked at affordable housing. In other words, there's a gateway requirement that you're gonna do it, and we already have two of those in place. So we've got our inclusionary zoning and we have our linkage fee. And so I feel like we've done a good job starting there. So that's kind of like the baseline or the floor. And when I look at affordable housing on this list, I would think of it as going above and beyond that. So in other words, if we're gonna talk about that as one or more choices that can be made, it's if the project is going to go above and beyond it. Affordable commercial, absolutely. I think we're doing good there. I view arts and cultural uses, like you guys answered Mary, I think it should be space for art to be practiced and not judgment about what kind of public art gets put there. That's kind of the building owner's choice as they design the project. Um, and, and then I also agree about everything that's been said about social services. Um, I, and publicly accessible open common spaces, we have design guidelines, right, that for projects require a certain amount of public space. There's also, if I'm not mistaken, a contribution that gets made to parks. Is there, is that part of uh, uh, one of the fees that gets paid? So through the site review process, we can't require that spaces be open to the public. So um, I think putting some standards to that would probably be helpful if that were the goal. So let's take a step back. Do projects contribute to parks land acquisition at the moment? Yeah, there's an impact fee. Oh, well, yeah, as far oh, as impact, yeah, impact, impact fee, fee, yeah. So, so I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm in site review mode. That's okay. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. So I agree about adding open common spaces to this list, which are above and beyond what is already required. So it's only an additional community benefit if it goes above and beyond what the development standards require at the moment. So that's my answer to the question, Dan, I have a quick comment, which is there was a section of the packet that talked about what's available currently uh, in site plan review as far as community benefits. And I had one specific comment was that a section that got mentioned over and over and over again on that list is a section that says the first line of the site plan review criteria, which is, this project will meet the zoning standards and the comp plan standards. And the reality is we almost never use that one, right? We're discouraged by staff, both planning and legal, from tying back into the comp plan for obvious reasons because it's a non-balanced decision. So I would just say, while I agree that some of those benefits actually arise from site plan review, oftentimes they're extremely nebulous and our ability to condition on them is really found either deeper in the site plan review criteria or not at all. So one of the whole points of this, I just wanna put a bow on this, is that we want to be able to condition using this as part of it, and if we can do that, that that will really improve, I think, the quality we get from projects. Thank you. Overall, I really, I really like this list, and I agree with um, you know, Bob and Cindy, that all eight are good. I, the biggest things, I think maybe this isn't the right time to get into it, but how we're gonna find ways to make these all equal is of concern to me. For example, um, 
publicly accessible open space and uh, you know better design, which I totally agree with Mary on the cupolas and stuff. Those are. Um, two things that would enhance the project for the developer tremendously. Well, wow, we can get ha extra, you know, outdoor space and the, these beautiful things, and um, potentially then they can charge more for, you know, the, the housing there. They can charge more for the commercial there. So, so then, like, like to your point that it's going to flow to the path of, of least resistance. Just, as, I just want to be careful as we set this up that, like, we're really making these you know, comparable to one another. And, um, and, and that we'd allow room for flexibility, that if, if everyone does just choose one way, that we, you know, we reevaluate. So, so I think, um, and I have like lots of questions if we go through all eight on how we'd set up the details, but, but that's for a later conversation. But my, my broad comment is like, let's just really try to th think about how to make these gen relatively equal. <laughs> So yeah, I was I was going to make that same point. There, there's the because you have to. I think we're we're talking about quantifying. Like Austin does a good job of that, right? I mean, they, it's not nebulous. They quantify how what you have to provide in order to get what, and that makes sense to me as an approach. Um, so you have to think with a longer list. There's a lot to quantify, and then how you make them equal to each other is a little challenging. So I, I think we want to, I, I agree with keeping more of these things on the list, but I think we want to focus in on them as we get to next stages. Because like mobility and parking is a is a big possible bucket, and what are the actual things we would want to put in there that requires some discussion. Like for example, in the packet you mentioned, more connections could be a, a possible one. Well, actually, I think site review process does a great job already at giving us the connections that we need. We're able, there are site review criteria about it. We're able to create permeability and paths. I, I never saw a problem with that, um, that one in particular. So we'll, we'll have to think about that going forward. Uh, one mobility thing I will call out is uh, that I thought I had promise was uh, satellite parking. Um, that, that's something that we've talked about maybe encouraging. So that would be one that I think could make a good addition to that list. The, I th the flow chart you're starting to work on made sense to me in terms of, well, if it's a residential, here's one set. Um, maybe focus on affordable housing. If it's commercial, if it's non-residential, there's a different set. Make sure that mixed use gets included in there um, when you're thinking about that, because um, it's a kind of project that we generally like to, like to encourage. Um, I, I do like the idea of, particularly for residential, of a minimum requirement for affordable housing. Say, okay, you have to do at least this much affordable housing, and then you can turn to the rest of the menu. Um, but since that is our kind of critical community need, uh, getting back getting uh, getting back to the idea of focusing on certain things, um, I think uh, that's what we, we should have that kind of requirement. I liked it from Austin, and and maybe some of the other ones that we'd like to see more of maybe could be a maximum of you know 10 percent of the community benefits or. You know, I think we, we might not require multiple community benefits from a project, maybe there's a menu of options and maybe we place we place maximums. Um, I, in terms of the open and common spaces, there have been some good comments on that. Uh, one of the items on that list could be uh, conservation easements of environmentally sensitive land. Um, could be a good one on that one. Um, I do, I'm very glad to see social services in here, and I'll, I'll just reiterate my thought from before about the idea of maybe there's a combination of affordable commercial and social services. Maybe that's, there. there's one program that, that, that gets rolled into where you say, well, you enter into this program, it could be social services or it could be lower, um, lower than market rate for local businesses or something like that. So those are things to consider. Something else I noticed, I forget which city had it, but there was an, uh, an encouragement for family-friendly housing, um, and I thought that had promise as well, and that's not in this list, but uh, units designed such that um, families can live there, and then amenities in the project, uh, like uh, play spaces for kids, or green spaces that are protected and have entrances at the level of the green space where you can have your kids run out and play while you watch them, um, things like that. And um, last one was, I, I'm very glad the arts and culture is in here. I want to do a shout out to members of the arts community who have been advocating for arts and culture as a community benefit for years, and it's coming to fruition in this list, which I'm really happy to see. I'll echo my colleagues about focusing on studio live work um, and especially performance space, make sure that we get that in there as a focus for arts and culture. But I mean, con conceivably we could have a, a small allowed uh, piece of it for a public art on the, like 
in the right or next to the right of way or something. Something that's very public under strict criteria could maybe let you meet just a little bit because um, we don't get a lot of public art in this town. And I think we could use some more. I'll leave it at that. That was very comprehensive. So I won't repeat. I'm I'm liking what actually I'm liking what all of you said, but. Um, I guess I would just say that I think some things are more important than others. So I like this idea of we got the, not the, is it the gatekeeper? Right. And then we've got some big ones and then we got some bonus ones. I think that makes sense. And so I think this is the right list, but I don't think, I don't think they're all equal. So I think with this notion that you could get 10% here, or anyhow, trying to figure out how you want a little bit of something of, of some of these, but you want a lot of affordability. And I, I guess affordability, I think, is, is, is kind of the biggest. That said, I was just in Grand Rapids, which is a public art city. And oh my god, what a difference that makes. And so, um, yes, trying to figure out how to accommodate that. It shouldn't replace affordability, but uh, again, um, there are some amenities that would really help build community even as we get bigger. Because I do think there's, those are some of the nexuses we're talking about is people, uh, we're getting more people, I, we don't know each other as much. Okay, well, let's, how do we create that sense of uniqueness and, um, I don't know, branding about who we are and stuff. Anyhow, public art fits into that. Lisa. I just had a question in, in reading the memo and talking about art. Do we allow murals to just be painted when they want, or do we have prohibitions on that? Well, there's not prohibitions, but we have a sign code that um, defines what a commercial sign is. So that's what we have to evaluate murals on. So like in Philadelphia, especially in South Philadelphia, and then in Center City, Philadelphia, there's like the Mural Mile, mm -hmm. and it is phenomenal. And their Arts Commission, I think they give grants to allow these murals and they go, the artist goes before the commission, but it makes such beautiful art space. And when you go down to South Philadelphia, it's like the people have kind of taken over, which is very cool. And um, they do mirror, mirror murals and um, it's just art. You're just washed in art. I think where we run afoul here is when, um, for example, if a business owner wants to paint a mural on the side of their tavern, for example, and it's beer mugs or somehow advertising what it is that they sell or what happens in the building, that's a commercial signage issue. So that's where we run afoul, usually with murals. Okay. So I think we're moving on. To okay. You guys, yeah. ah, you're killing me. So you, you don't like, okay. You're the last comment, and then we're going to the third question. Right. Yeah, just just one more thing. I That's like the, in reading through all the examples too, there were a couple of things that jumped out at me. I already mentioned one of them, one which which was the labor requirement. I don't know where you work this stuff in, but I wanted to put it out there so that you. Hopefully we'll think about it as you run through this, but the labor requirements that requiring the housing to be rented to people that live in town so that it doesn't go to like people that rent an apartment and come two weeks a year or something. Um, and the rest of the time it's a, it's a, um, was it an STR? Yes, thank you. And then the other one that, that caught my eye too was um, a some sort of a financial um, requirement for businesses, um, people that are displaced through redevelopment or, um, yeah. Question number three. Okay, so question number three relates to Appendix J. So we're just asking for feedback on whether to add or remove sites from Appendix J, whether to remove it entirely or do not change it. Oh boy. So this isn't a discussion about what might be added or subtracted. It's simply a process question. What did Planning Board have to say? We were really mixed on this. I mean, some folks wanted to get rid of the map altogether and just do a citywide project. Some folks wanted to keep the map, maybe modify it if there are sub-community plans or area plans done. 
and some folks thought, you know, minor tweaks to the map might be okay. So it was really just the whole gamut, really. So I'm sorry, we weren't very helpful on that one. Okay, Aaron. A clarifying question. So there's there's two big distinctions here. One is, do you, do we change it in the next few months? And the other is, what do we do after we're finished with the community benefit discussion? And those are two very different things. So can you clarify what you're asking here? So one note on the planning board input reflects what we've heard in our like focus group sessions and in discussions where there's we haven't really seen a clear path forward. And so before spending any time asking that question of the community, we wanted to check in with council to make sure that we were going in a direction that was at the will of the council. Um, a lot of these projects that would be requesting to participate in this program would likely be contingent on being included on Appendix J. And so the question has come up over the process of should we um, look at other sites outside of that map and, and perhaps add or remove sites based on a public process. And so if the answer was yes, do that, then we would amend our public process to, to, to do that and have that discussion. If not, then we wouldn't. Um, I don't know if that's answering your so question. No, it actually didn't answer it at all. My question was, <laughs> to say it again, are you talking about changing the map in the next few months during the community benefit process, or are you talking about changing it after we're finished with the community benefit process and we've like finalized the code changes? I don't think we've identified that as an interim step. I think it's just the outcome. It would all be probably done as one package, I think is what I'm thinking. Hmm? But at so, the end, so not Yeah, the with, with new code changes for community benefit and revising Appendix J. So could I just ask a process question? And that has to do, we just had a vote on the height um, moratorium and when we look at it again, I don't know why we would want to look at this now and why we wouldn't want to bring it back in May of 2020 or whenever it's going to come back. So that's just a, just a that's question. A comment. Well, and Barry, uh, who else has their hand up? I'm a little confused by this question because we, I thought we looked at this when we passed the, the May 2020, yep. um, and some of us wanted to um, release areas by when they got um, sub-community plans and to, to keep it in place indefinitely and then release areas as sub-community plans became available. So I'm kind of hearing some of that in this question. So is is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly one of the options. And I, I don't know that we've gotten definitive direction on that. I think when, when it was extended to May 2020, you know, we we had to look into this further as part of this process. That's partly why it was extended. So one of those options might be to only revise it if uh, if an area plan is done. But we, we're, we're wanting to hear to, if that's definitely the case. With well, the that's what I wanted that night that we voted on. So I would say that would be my preference to um, release areas as sub-community plans get done. That's, that's your, Bob? I, I guess I'm confused too. We have a lot of furrow brows over here. I mean, realistically, I mean, you guys want to get this community, this, this benefit stuff done by the, the third quarter of next year, right? And then we have got 2020, which is a few months later. Realistically, are we going to have any area plans done in that time frame? No. Probably so, not. So isn't this a moot question? I mean, I, I go back to Aaron's question. If you're asking, do we want to mess with this between now and when this project's done or 2020, I think the answer is no. We just fought that battle. Um, so why don't we just leave things alone? Because what you're doing here is going to answer these questions, right? I mean, yes, theoretically, if there's an area plan that pops up and gets approved, could we add it to, to Appendix J at that point in time? Sure, that's probably not going to happen, and we always have the discretion to do that if that, in the unlikely event that happened. So shouldn't we have this um, project, which is only going to take another 12 to 18 months, go through its completion and just kind of maintain the status quo so, between so now and then. I think there's a little bit of a, if we do a really good job here, it will, we will have a productive conversation about then where would we allow more of this? Right. Because and we that, have, that might be the answer now. To I me, mean, that's what, that's why we're doing this. When you look at the at Appendix J now, it, it obviously has geographic areas where you can ask for a height mod, but you also can, 
have projects like permanently affordable housing that has more than 40% of its foyer is exempt from those areas. It can be anywhere in the city. So we might find through further discussion that these community benefits can be also be exempted. You know, so I, I think we're just trying to get a, well, I think a general sense. Well, I'm giving you my opinion. I know you're next. If we do a good job here and people feel like, oh, yes, I would take more height for that. That's what frees up the conversation. So I wouldn't say exempt it. It, it allows us to reshape where we want this stuff to happen that we just decided would give us community benefit. So to me, you do this, and then you have that conversation. Yeah, I don't think this is the right venue for this, to be honest with you. I mean, I felt that was also the case when we were voting on it at 11.30 at night, and it was not something we had had a broad community discussion about. If we were going to do something like this, I think it would need, if we were going to consider these kinds of changes and or requiring sub-community plans in order to release areas or whatever it was, I think that's got to be the subject of its own set of discussion and hearing. I had thought if we would do that, and I'm really ambivalent about whether I want to, it would be in the sub-community planning process because that's where you could make some kind of statement like I want, you know, only a sub-community plan to be able to allow that kind of um, regulation. So I guess I am not comfortable saying anything about this except certainly not here it would be, uh, I don't think this is appropriate. Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll basically just agree with Zan. I'll just emphasize that. I think we get through this process. Hopefully it'll be a great process. We'll come out with something we're all happy with. And then sometimes between the conclusion of this process and May of 2020, we discuss this. Yeah. Does that, does that work? That, that's the okay. exact feedback we were looking for. Thank you. There you go. Hey, we were clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. for once. And when it involves punting, we're really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number four. The, the next question really just talks a little bit about our engagement moving forward. Um, so we are planning, you know, a lot of these projects start off with a lot, kind of an open house and larger events. Um, in this case, we sort of flipped that on its head and we, we decided to have some focus groups and some community visit with community organizations and have kind of a lot of more one on one or small group conversations about this to at least start assessing what are the options because we didn't have a whole lot to go out to the community about. Now we feel like we're at a point where we can talk intelligently about a program that we would create at the city. And so now in the next month, about the next month, month and a half, we'd be looking to have um, an outward facing larger event. We'd be looking at reassembling those participants that gave their time in focus groups, um, doing some drop in events, um, pulling together some experts in the community and staff or in technical groups to help um, provide feedback on some of these topics. Um, we visited with a number of boards and commissions that we described in the report and we'd continue to be um, working with them. HAB has designated two members to kind of be our central point of contact, for example. And so we have a framework at least in play that identifies those things moving forward. Um, one of the big questions that remains um, was brought up initially by a planning board member and then I believe it was brought up at CAC again um, about a process committee concept similar to that of the comprehensive plan. And so given that it was brought up at CAC, we I believe told um, CAC afterwards that we'd bring it up during this meeting. Um, the question was, would it be useful to have some sort of um, a couple of council delegates, planning board, et cetera, um, to meet on, at, on some sort of reoccurring basis to advise on, on process and other things for this project? Um, we as staff talked a little bit more about it um, and we thought it was a great idea. We also thought we'd like to perhaps offer that um, the scope you could consider broadening to include all of the code amendments and not just this one specific project since there's a number of them in the works. And so that's probably one of the more important things relating to this question that we wanted to highlight for you. But if you had any other kinds of questions around process that we've outlined in the report, we'd love that feedback too. A clarifying question. The process committee is what you would expand to all of them, but the process we're weighing in on is just the, the one we've been talking about tonight. We're, we're not weighing in on how to do your use tables. We're just talking about, right. Yeah. I just wanna, okay, so let's just break this up. What, what do people think about the process committee idea? I think 
think it's a good idea. I think it's been helpful. It was helpful in the housing group. It was helpful in, the, I think it's helpful in the open space master plan. Um, I think having two council members, and I, I would extend it to planning board, and I guess have, is have in there now or not? No, I don't know, I but I definitely include um, uh, planning board and council members in there, and I think it just helps bring the process along. Do others agree with the idea? I guess I would just say I think it's important to get a, a diversity of our representatives. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that w that has served us well on the comp plan and on the open space master plan. And housing. It, it and just what? housing. Uh, and housing. Yep. Yeah, I, I think it can be value. It is a bit of a heavy lift. I mean, it's it's definitely some extra time. So to that point, I, I like your idea of role. We're working on a lot of planning related things. I like that idea of including all of them in the process committees. Uh, purview so that it gives, um, you're getting more bang for your, your buck and agree with having uh, planning board uh, members participating as well. Yeah, and I would just add, that's how the open, I think also the, the, the comp plan, but the open space process committee has um, two council members and two uh, open space board of trustees members. Okay, did, did planning board care? Or um, well, uh, Phil summarized our comments really well already, but oh. yeah, we definitely supported the idea of the process committee. We thought that worked really well with the comp plan. Okay, cool. So that's a yes. And it sounds like planning board, we want planning board and us. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anybody disagree? Sam has been holding up his hand. Oh, he always has. Um, okay, anything else on process? No. Sorry. So I will not be volunteering for this committee because I'm already on the open space process co committee. So, but just one thought, just to make sure that we reach out extensively to people who don't show up at meetings all the time and, and particularly our kind of underrepresented communities in town. We're making a big effort on that in the open space uh, master plan outreach. So like I said, like drop in events like at coffee shops and things, and that's great. Just make sure you don't only hit things that are patronized by people over 100% AMI. It's like, um, so, uh, Go to yeah, play just that, that that comment. Other process stuff. I, I assume this is in your technical and focus groups, but but I um, presumably the, that would include people that actually build buildings, right? Okay, so we're not just kind of making stuff up and then find out the development community says that's the stupidest thing I ever heard, right? So we want we want to make sure that we're actually living in the world of reality, right? And and I will just say that to me the. I keep coming back to the Austin flowchart because to me that was like, oh, now this is interesting. This is provocative. How would you rate these things? How would you? And to me, that's a, a good tool to use, either filled in or not, but with a few examples. But then that's a really provocative tool that I think, I, I, at least for me, it, uh, I think would be very useful in a, a bunch of audiences so people can think about what's important to them, um, what it's worth, how would you prioritize, what is got essential and what would be nice. So I'll just offer that up. You know? So I agree with Zan about the flow chart. I also think it would be helpful to have packets, which are small, but which are the case study summaries, because I think it gives people a certain amount of reassurance to know, hey, look, other communities have done this, here's how it worked for them, we can craft it for our community. But the knowledge that it's not just, you know, this crazy one-off idea is useful. Um, Bob, to your point, I mean, we definitely have to work with developers to understand how, because this, this is a bunch of nitty-gritty stuff, right, about parking use, development standards, and so unintended consequences are a lot of what we're trying to clean up now. So if we are trying to clean up unintended consequences, we definitely have to run it past the people who will be implementing the rules that are gonna get made here. So I think that's important as well. Um, I would be interested for what it's worth on this process subcommittee, um, just because it's an area that I think is really important and I'd be happy to work with whoever else might be. Hey, so add that to the list of two other committees we're gonna talk about on the fourth. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, and I encourage people that haven't had a chance to do that yet to consider volunteering. Um, one other thought I would just throw out there is, um, we've done this on a few other issues, is to me this is a really interesting uh, 
interesting policy question. And so maybe we say, hey, ULI, sponsor some salons. Hey, I mean, let's do some of those things. I mean, if need be, let's have somebody from Santa Monica come and, I mean, we already have somebody from Austin here, but um, I don't know. But to me, this is, this is interesting stuff where we're gonna learn from f other folks that have done it. Let's invite them and let's engage different segments of the community that like to focus on aspects of this. So, well, anything else? Yep. No, I'm, I have, my comments have to do with something else, so oh. I'm done with that. Well, is there anything else on this question that people want to add? Okay. Well, I mean, it would be good while we're going through that is to do Channel 8 and do social media. But definitely, I think Channel 8 and I think um, Patrick and the communications people could actually put some stuff really well together, interviews, some um, discussions with different people, just so that the people know um, what's going on. And I think we do get a lot of hits on Channel 8, and so it's a good way to communicate what we're doing. Can I add school fairs? Parents are so bored at those things. <laughs> Oops, kids sports events, yeah. to that point. Well, and um, the whole, um, we did really well on some of these other things, growing up older, and, but also having the CU design folks think about some mm -hmm. of this. Anyhow, we're getting good at, we're, well, I think we're getting better at engaging in a creative way. So we've learned a few things in the last couple processes. So let's use some of those successes. Okay, hey, how about almost on time? Can, can oh, I you just... you have something else? Yeah. So, so, and maybe, can you go back to question two? I'm sorry, Suzanne. You'll thank me tomorrow night. So, so one of the things that I had um, a couple things. One, and I guess it's on page 245, and we're talking about industrial general, industrial service, and industrial manufacturing. And I'm wondering, um, and of course, it depends where it would be and stuff, but right now in industrial general, my understanding is that if somebody owns a, a lot that's zoned industrial general, then they, and they wanna do some housing on it, they cannot do housing on it unless there's one sixth contiguity right. of housing next adjacent to them. There's some performance standards to do residential right. and industrial. And I guess, you know, since we're trying to really push for or get affordable housing, um, I guess I would like to throw into this mix um, incentives for um, for developers to come forward that have industrial general that are interested in doing housing, but may, affordable housing, but may not be contiguous to some land that is already housing. And um, I can think of several sites, and I know we wanna be very careful in terms of our industrial, but I think there could be some benefit, and I think we should at least consider it instead of just saying, no, it doesn't meet the standards. And, um, and I think that goes to, I know Aaron's talked a lot about it, um, you know, where you could still have some industrial or, or retail on that first, first floor, but then you could get affordable housing on upper, upper floors. And I think at some point we will want to look at industrial general, how much we really need, um, and could we incent it's actually on our work program. It grew out of the comp plan. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I want to say it's something 19 or 20. Yeah, you know, I'd like study. to look at it now in this in this pile um, and see if we could do it because I think um, people will go forward. You know, people want to develop their properties. Okay, and so for me, what part of this whole discussion is is giving people a menu of options and say, hey, you know what, instead of doing another industrial general development, what we really need is affordable housing, and if we can incent you to do that, even though you don't meet the performance standards, we'll, we'll have a conversation with you and let's see where that goes. So I would like to include that. I mean, we're trying to get affordable housing, and so I, I see the, this as some opportunity. Okay, 
Uh, oh, just uh, if I could provide it with just a brief uh, r response to that. I think one of the upcoming projects where maybe we have the opportunity to do that, and, and, and Carl in, in early on where he gave a real quick summary of the uh, other code amendments we're working on, um, you may recall at your January 2018 you retreat, you identified the use table as, a, as an area where we ought to think about modifications, and, and I believe um, you, you, you ask the planning board to take a, a, a significant role in doing that, and so the planning board now has actually created a subcommittee and is, and is up and sort of beginning to be up and running on that. I think the use table offers an opportunity as well. Carl alluded to that because one of the things when he talked about the use table was uh, perhaps modifications to the use table that will allow the creation of 15-minute communities. Mm -hmm. So when we start looking at the use table and there's this different zoning districts, including what you're talking about, that's an opportunity to talk about what are what do we have the opportunities to create through modifications to the use table within any different zone district? Right. I guess my concern is that um, properties might get developed that would, if we wait too long, they're going to go forward and do industrial instead of housing. And I would really like to encourage some kind of housing, and that's why I'm bringing it up here. So. Uh, it, it's just what do we want, and um, I think we want and we need housing. So, and then I had, um, and then this has to do with so the can height. I, and can this I just is, throw something in on that? Okay. Do you want it? Just, just that, like, it very simply could just be that um, housing could be a community benefit in an industrial zone. Yep. Kind of end of story. Thank you. Um, and then just one last question, and it has to do with height, and it's not like I want to go, you know, really high. But I just was reviewing my notes here, and, um, you know, I think the areas that you guys were considering include the BVRC, Table Mesa, Basemar, Diagonal Plaza, and um, I think especially I just think about Diagonal Plaza and some of the emails we've been getting. And that has been an albatross for at least 20 years in terms of um, severely underdeveloped. And I guess, you know, I would like to see at least, um, if somebody comes forward with some, some ideas, that maybe we would talk about it. But um, it's, again, this whole thing of we're going to get something developed, but is it really what we want? versus um, encouraging and incentivizing people to develop something that really serves our needs. So I'll just leave it at that. But I think it's really important, and I would hate um, for any of those properties to come forward and um, not get to our goals. So I, it's just a comment, and so I don't know. I, anyway, parking lots really don't do a lot for us, you know? Okay. okay. Are we good? You get what you need? All right. Thank, thank you. you, Liz, for thank joining you. us. This has been fun. Yep. Good night, everybody. See you tomorrow night. Paris en France 24.